Hey guys, Tori here from Overlook Horizon. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Good morning to you. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome back. I haven't seen all of y'all in a while. I mean, that, I can't really see you guys at, in the first place anyways, but uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming and hanging out with us uh, this morning. If you're here, if you're watching the replay, uh, just in case you don't know how this works, I'll put timestamps in the description below in case you want to jump around to the broadcast because it's going to be a little bit of a, uh, a longer one here today. Uh, but today, we've got an astronaut launch. This is a Axiom-1 mission here today on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon. Uh, they are headed to the International Space Station. This will be the first private mission, all private mission, all private astronauts to the International Space Station. So kind of exciting. I feel like this is something that has been talked about for years and years and years. And people have talked about, you know, being able to have space uh, tourists and visitors and people go to the International Space Station, you know, like it's a like it's a hotel that you, you could just go book on uh, on the Internet machine. But uh, now it's finally happening. We're getting private astronauts going to the International Space Station. I don't think it's quite down to the price where, uh, you know, maybe uh, the everyday person could just go on uh, go online and book a ticket. But we're getting there, right? It's one step at a time here. So. It's kind of exciting. We're, uh, we're we're still a couple hours away from launch, about three and a half hours away from launch, right? Uh, so three and a half hours away from launch. Oh, we've got our timeline here up in the uh, top left corner. Uh, that'll give you the rundown of events that are happening here today. So we should be uh, pretty close to uh, uh, astronaut suit up. Uh, we don't have uh, images yet. We'll have that from SpaceX here uh, shortly. They're gonna go live here in maybe about 10 minutes or so. And then we'll get to get a look at the astronauts um and we uh they'll depart they'll go to the pad they'll load up into the into the crew dragon vehicle we'll kind of hang out for a while after uh after they close the hatch then we got a little bit of a, a downtime might take a little bit of a break at that point uh, and then about uh 45 minutes prior or so then we get fuel up and uh, we count it down to launch which is at 11 17 a.m eastern time today and uh, they're going to head up to the International Space Station. They're going to be at the ISS for eight days. And then they come back. And then uh, that's it. That's a nice short little mission. And uh, that's what we got going on today. So let's check in with people in the chat. Hello, everybody. Hey, uh, one of our longtime members, Lim. Thanks for the super chat there. Said long time no see. Yeah, it's been a while. Thanks, Lim. Thanks for the super chat. Thanks for being a channel member. Uh, yeah, we've... Uh, it's, it's been a busy time uh, lately, and we don't. There's not a lot of like Starship development. We were going crazy for there for a little while with uh, you know Starship launching every couple of weeks, and that was a that was a crazy time in the spaceflight world. But things have kind of slowed down on the Starship front. Uh, we've got uh, not sure, not really sure what's happening there. The next step, the next kind of stage for Starship is to go orbital, uh, but. They're waiting for an environmental review, although we just saw the other day that the Army Corps of Engineers kind of pulled out uh, and said that SpaceX didn't give them the information they've been asking for. So not sure what's going to happen there. Um, Elon, at the last Starship update, did say that they, uh, they have the opportunity. They could just go to Cape Canaveral if things are too complicated. So maybe SpaceX is kind of just saying that that's what they're going to do. I mean, they wouldn't completely abandon abandoned Boca Chica, but uh, Boca Chica would turn into like a uh, kind of a development center instead of the actual orbital uh, launch platform. But I would still love to see it launch out of Boca Chica. Just, uh, you know, the whole uh, the, the whole thing was built from the ground up. I feel like we were all there watching it built from the ground up. I'd love to see it, you know, go orbital from there. I don't know. I, mean, I guess in the end, it doesn't really matter. But as long as it goes orbital, who cares where it's launched from? But I would kind of like to see it go from Boca Chica. Uh, let's see. Let's check in uh, with a cut. Why is my ch there we go? I'm having a hard time scrolling my chat here. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I can't get this out of the way. Okay. All right, so let's see. You see all a whole bunch of our regulars. Anita, of course, one of our amazing moderators. Carrie Ann, hello, longtime channel member. William Pelner, another longtime channel member. Good morning to you. Ken needs a third monitor. <laughs> I got four going this morning. Uh, what time is liftoff? Yeah, so we got three and a half hours to liftoff, so uh, we're 
we st we still got some time here to kind of hang out. It'll be a little bit of a, a chill morning here while we wait for things to start happening. But we got some stuff to look at. We'll take a look at uh, what the weather's doing, what the mission's going to be like, what our trajectory is going to be. We'll take a look at all those things. Uh, let's see. Wild West Dan, good morning to you. Another one of our amazing channel moderators. So this is going to convince him to get out of bed and go downstairs to his computer. <laughs> I know it is a, it's an early morning, but not a crazy early morning, which is kind of nice, right? Uh, my time, seven at seven thirty, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, people on the west coast are uh, not happy with a launch this early in the morning. But by the time it actually launches, it'll be a decent time of day. Let's see, Virginia. Good morning, another longtime channel member, Fritz forty six. Good morning as well. Another longtime channel member. Let's see. Let Tori. Oh, there you go. Wild West Dan said, "Let Tori see you," because I said, I, "I said I never see your faces." <laughs> Wild West Dan says, "Let Tori see you." Post a selfie in our Discord, the Share Your Stuff channel. All right, if you if you post a selfie in there, I'll go look at them. Then I can then I can see you. You guys all see me, right? There's probably about. I'd say 90% of the people at home going, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's all right. Sebi the Time Waster, one of our longest serving channel moderators. Maybe, the, are you, uh, Sebi, are you the, uh, no, Gregorius is the longest, the longest serving one. I don't see, he's not here today, but I think Time Waster is our, uh, our uh, second in command there from the moderators maybe maybe uh first in command lately i think gregorius like me busy some days which is cool how's how's the flying going says citizen phillips uh it's going well i got my i got my flying mug here today just in case you want let me see if i can get this in focus how planes fly that's my that's my mug today I don't know, can you read it? It says, uh, uh, it says, air, oh, let's see, I get it, this is backwards. Uh, air goes here, uh, air goes here and here, and let me see. I gotta do this with my other hand, I can't do it this way. Can we do it that way? Can I use, there we go, that's so much better. Focus on this thing. No, there we go. How planes fly! The air goes here, the air goes there, the air goes there. We have a uh, very important magic that happens over here. Uh, a little more magic that happens here. And uh, we also have some more magic that happens back here as well. And uh, that's how planes fly. So I have my flying mug today. <laughs> uh, let's see, have no, have no fear. Foxy Paws is here. All right, Foxy Paws, good to see you here. Good morning. Been all night. Odie's been all night up all night waiting for the show. <laughs> Who are the crew members? Yeah, I'll get into that here in just a moment here uh, for the the Axiom One crew members. Just checking in with everybody. Want to want to see who's here? Who got up in the morning here with us? Are there more Axiom missions planned if this mission goes well? Yes, actually, Axiom is Axiom's plan is to uh is to try to launch to the to the space station twice a year uh so they're trying to do this pretty regularly after this so this is kind of just the first one uh that's why it's called Ax axiom one and not just like the axiom mission uh, but this is axiom one uh, and there will be a, an axiom two if you recall i don't know if you remember this or but um there was speculation like way back that uh, Tom Cruise was going to be on this mission uh, to go up and film a, a movie at the International Space Station. Uh, his, spoiler alert, he's not. Uh, but uh, they did they did say that there are still plans for him to do that on a later Axiom mission. Um, so yes, there are more Axiom missions planned after this. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Tori's gonna show us how his flying's going using Kerbal. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's probably not the best way to describe how my flying's going. But uh, who knows? Maybe maybe we'll look at a. We could always I could always show a flying video on here or something, if 
when we have a uh, we have some downtime but let's talk about axiom one here to start with i think i caught up oh we should give the facebook people some love too uh i see patricia over on facebook says good morning uh we got good morning from bangladesh good morning from greece watching from the uk could day to keep the carb heat checked often says says royal over on facebook <laughs> he's referring in case you're not familiar carb heat that's my carburetor heat in my airplane something that you know you have it's a carbureted engine and uh in an airplane if your carburetor uh ices up get uh induction icing from the air going th being sucked in through the carburetor uh that's very bad because then you stop getting air to your engine and uh we kind of need we need some air to do the the boom boom which makes the engine go vroom vroom so uh if the if the carburetor ices up that's bad so there's a heater or while well, there's a way to heat up the carburetor using uh a different air source that's warmer air that can heat the uh heat up the carburetor and melt any ice that may have formed and plug the carburetor anyways well that was a long <laughs> that was a long story that i didn't think i was going to go down that road but but the important thing is you need you need airflow to get the boom boom to do the vroom vroom. That's if there's anything you take away from that, that's what it is. Okay, so let's talk about Axiom One here. Uh, we've talked about airplanes enough, and uh, we'll see what's on deck here for today. So here's the Axiom uh, the Axiom One mission. Oh, actually, I don't think there's uh, details on this page, actually. I was going to scroll through here, um, but it doesn't have the details like they normally do. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. I was about to go on here and show you the details. They're aren't. they are not here. Okay, well, I have another place that has details. I'll just read them to you while you guys look at this. Um, so our backup date uh, for launch is going to be uh, tomorrow. Hopefully we don't have it. It is an instantaneous launch window today. So uh, we've got a we're meeting up with the International Space Station. That means we got to time the launch so that we can actually meet up with the International Space Station. So uh, so instantaneous launch window. There is a backup tomorrow. There's also another backup after that. Uh, we've got four crew on board. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher their names. I'm so bad with names, but uh, Michael Lopez Allegria is the spacecraft commander. The pilot is Larry Connor. Uh, mission specialists are Mark Pathy and Eaton Stibb. Eaton? Eaton. Eaton. I don't know how to say that that name. Somebody help me out with the pronunciation there. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's going to be a Falcon 9. Crew Dragon. This is Crew Dragon Endeavor. The same Crew Dragon that launched on Demo 2 with Bob and Doug and also launched Crew 2. Um, and right now, we have Crew 3. It is at the International Space Station, commanded by Raja Chari. Uh, they are there right now, so there will be uh, two Crew Dragons docked at the ISS here uh, shortly. And then, actually, they're scheduled to come home, and Crew 4 is going to go up there. That's just in a couple of weeks. Not even weeks. It just, is it weeks? Yeah, uh, barely weeks. It's like April 20th, I think, they're, they're scheduled. Somewhere around there, right? Um, so we are going to do a uh, drone ship landing here today for the first stage booster that's going to be out at sea, uh, 541 kilometers downrange. And uh, yeah, the mission is heading to the space station. We'll dock, hang out there for eight days, and come on back. So this is now the 154th Falcon family launch, 146th Falcon 9, right? So the other, uh, the other launches, we've got uh, Falcon 1s. We had four of those, and we had uh, some Falcon Heavy. Uh, this is the 33rd orbital flight of the Dragon family capsule. So that, right, that includes uh, Dragon 1 and Crew Dragon, which is sometimes called Dragon 2. 11th orbital flight of a Dragon 2. 7th orbital flight of Crew Dragon 2, right? So we have a Crew Dragon variant, and we have a Cargo Dragon variant. So see, you start to read these numbers up, and you're like, wow, really? 11 orbital flights of... Dragon 2. Doesn't... But this is only the sixth Crew Dragon flight. So we had seven, we've had seven orbital flights of Crew Dragon. One was an uncrewed mission, uh, but this is now the sixth crewed, crewed Crew Dragon flight. Right. Uh, second commercial mission. So we had the Inspiration 4. That's actually the shirt I'm wearing here today. Can you see the Inspiration 4 logo? My Inspiration 4 uh, Crew Dragon shirt. I think that's the one I'm wearing. 
Uh, this is the first fully commercial mission to the International Space Station, the 13th SpaceX launch this just this year. 13 just this year. And we're only beginning of April. Uh, but it is the first, uh, first Dragon launch for the year. So there we go. There's uh, some details about uh, our mission here today. What's the difference between... Uh, this is from 1SB. What's the difference between the last between the last launch and this one. So I'm assuming you're referring to the Inspiration4 mission. Um, and really the biggest the biggest difference, is Inspiration4 was kind of just a, a, a launch to space. Uh, they did not go to the International Space Station. Uh, this is, the Axiom-1 mission is actually gonna go to the International Space Station. They, they have, they've gotten permission from NASA. Uh, they will dock there. They'll actually get out and hang out. Uh, Inspiration4 just stayed in the Crew Dragon for the entire duration of the mission. So they had that big glass dome on top, the cupola uh, on top of the Crew Dragon. Uh, this one does not have that because you can't can't have the dome, you need the docking adapter so they can dock to the International Space Station. So uh, this is much more, this is kind of like just a regular a NASA crewed mission, except the, the big difference is just that it's not NASA astronauts and it's not going to stay there for six months uh, so uh, this is this is much closer to like a I guess standard dragon launch I don't know if you want to call that the the, uh, the NASA mission standard uh, I have a feeling that the more we start doing commercial missions um, that's we we may stop using that that term but But uh, yeah, so that's really the the main difference between uh, Inspiration Four and uh, and this one is that this is going to uh, the the space station. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's talk about trajectory here. Where's our trajectory map? Here it is. Um, so this is courtesy of uh, my friend Declan over at FlightClub.io. If you want to play with the map yourself, go to FlightClub.io. Um, but here's the trajectory here for today, which is pretty much the, the usual trajectory we see when launching astronauts to the International Space Station. So northeast trajectory, just like usual, launching from launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center here. The big launch pad, launched Apollo, launched Space Shuttle, all that jazz there. Uh, launching from the big one. It's the only pad that SpaceX can use to launch Crew Dragon. They do have another launch pad at uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, it's down here smaller launch pad that can only launch uh, just a regular uh, Falcon 9. Can't do Falcon Heavy. You can launch Falcon 9 for like cargo uh, satellite missions like uh, uh, with a regular payload fairing and stuff like that. So, uh, But anyways, the the big pad does all the, the heavy lifting here. So we get uh, our first stage, right? Starts under powered flight. Uh, we get uh, cut off and separation. Second stage going to continue on into orbit. First stage going to come back down here and do a little bit of a landing right out, right out here at sea on the drone ship. Uh, then uh, second stage going to continue out into orbit. Uh, the actual cutoff, a lot of people get surprised by this, but the actual second stage cutoff is right here, right? So uh, you cut off the second stage here and then you're in orbit. That's it. That's all it takes. Like you just have to be under powered flight to here. So from, from here, let's see, from here to here, and that's it. Kind of cool. Uh, so, so yeah, that's the uh, the planned trajectory here. Those are uh, there are abort scenarios throughout the whole uh, trajectory there. So you'll hear those abort scenarios called out uh, as they ascend. So they'll usually say uh, they start off with uh, one alpha, uh, one bravo. Uh, then there'll be two alpha, two bravo, two charlie. Uh, you'll hear those call outs from the crew, or at least we're expecting them to. That's the, kind of the usual way that things go. Um, and they're, the crew on board is announcing or acknowledging that they've entered that particular abort phase, that abort scenario, uh, so that they know what is uh, what what to expect if they have a, an abort. So uh, we do have, looks like SpaceX is uh, live here. So they've they've started up. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna 
chat for a little bit and then we'll come uh, come back to them because I do want to finish up just a couple of things uh, just to let you know uh, what's going on then we'll listen in here for a little bit uh, but one of the uh, one of the main things that we're uh, we're considering to, I mean weather today is actually looking very very good um, so we've only got a 10% chance of violating our launch constraints only pri only concern is just the liftoff winds uh, there are some additional criteria we've got upper level wind shear at a moderate stage slightly concerning but I don't think it's going to be an issue uh, ascent corridor recovery remember because it's a crewed mission you have to have good weather the entire ascent corridor so for any of your abort scenarios you have to have good weather for a possible abort as well so basically they're looking at the weather from uh from cape canaveral pretty much all the way to like uh ireland and the uk area uh, because there are the final abort scenario could land them way out there uh, but basically they they have abort landings one would be right off the coast of cape canaveral another would be up by like north carolina area the next one after that would be like uh maine nova scotia area like way up in the north and after that is like ireland uk area and so there's a, a few different abort landing areas where you have to have good weather as well and then of course they could go all the way around and then just land back at a uh, a landing site uh that's either the gulf of mexico or off the uh off the coast of Cape Canaveral. I imagine if they went all, if they had to do some sort of all the way around and abort immediately, they'd probably have to come down in the Gulf of Mexico because the Earth is going to orbit underneath them, right? As they're as they're making that one orbit, and so just one orbit going to put their next pass way over here, right? So it would be kind of a long, be a be a tough stretch to try to get the Crew Dragon way over here. But they could stretch it and maybe do a, uh, they, I mean, they wouldn't do it at the last minute. They'd do some orbital changes like way back here to uh, point them to the like the Gulf of Mexico if they had to abort for some reason there. Uh, but anyways, back to weather. Weather's looking very good. It's just those liftoff winds that are really the, uh, the main concern here for today. And if you look at the liftoff winds, I mean, they're not crazy, but you know, the, the closer to the ground you are there, the, uh, the, more the tougher that can be for trying to get the right winds. So uh, at our launch time, right at 11 o'clock here, right at the coast, you can kind of see it's right between this this inland blue color and the uh, out to sea green color. So we're going from 10 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour, out to 20 miles an hour out here for winds. So they're getting a little bit strong. I mean, right at the pad, they're predicting, uh, you know, 17, 18 mile per hour winds. Um, so it's not too crazy, but uh, they're starting to get starting to get up there uh, for ground level winds. Uh, and then if we uh, bump it up, we can take a look at our our upper level winds, which have a moderate concern. You can kind of see why there's a moderate concern. You've got this upper level jet stream here that's going pretty much directly over Florida, right? And these are these are strong winds, 143 miles an hour right over the Cape, 150 miles an hour, 160 out here, uh, right over the, the recovery area. So these are pretty strong for winds. I mean, this is, I mean, when they're saying moderate, this is kind of where we get into like the area of, um, you know, the uh, concern. You get 140, 150, 160 mile an hour winds. The question is, what's that gradient like, right? So wind shear is gonna be a, ch is a rapid change in speed or direction. Um, so because, because it's going, it's kind of the, well, kind of the same level as the direction as the ground level winds, you, you know, I guess it's gonna depend on how fast that gradient changes. I mean, the good news is, is some of these lower level winds, as you kind of go up, they're all kind of going in this direction. So you're not getting a rapid, a rapid change in speed. So, uh, or rapid change in direction, I mean. But uh, yeah, they do get pretty quick, so. So, uh, yeah, the, the wind is really going to be uh, the concern today. Uh, you know, whether it's upper level, I think that they'll be OK, but they are pretty high. Uh, or those ground level winds, which are much slower speed, but, you know, much more sensitive way down there at ground level. Okay, <laughs> Fritz 46 says at least it's a tailwind. I know if only if only that would help them, uh, you know, tailwind you know, for me, a tailwind would be a fantastic thing flying an airplane. But uh, yeah, they they kind of bust through this this wind layer, you know, within just a few seconds. Uh, the problem is, we've talked about this before. When we talk about wind shear, here we'll use our 
big giant starship for demonstration purposes, right? So as you're going up through the atmosphere, if you're relatively stable, not a big deal, but you hit that up, you hit that upper level wind shear, right? If it changes direction or all of a sudden you get a, a real high speed gust of wind, it's gonna push the rocket whoop, off course, right? And your engines down at the bottom are gonna try to go whoop, and try to put it back on course. And then you can kind of get this this little bit of a wiggle effect here, right? So you can get it to, it, the wind's trying to push it this way, the engines are trying to push it this way, and if you get too much, even if it's just like, just like this, you know, it doesn't have to be like quite this drastic, but for demonstration purposes, but even just a little wiggle like this, rockets don't have a lot of strength this way, right? They got a lot of strength this way, but not this way. So uh, just that little bit of a, uh, little bit of a battle that might go on there between the the wind and the engines trying to correct uh you can get uh basically structural damage is uh kind of a big uh a big concern so so yeah that's kind of the the concern with those upper level winds all right let's check in uh well spacex is going through oh why is that so grainy? Huh. I don't know why that's so grainy. We're at 1080. Oh, there it goes. All of a sudden. Um, all right, we'll check in with them here in just a minute. Looks like they're kind of doing a, a bit of an intro package here. Uh, let's go back to... Uh, we'll take a look uh, here at the International Space Station. Oh, you want to see uh, this view. At the International Space Station... Here's a look at uh, where that's currently located here. So, all right, so here's the US, here's our launch, uh, our launch site here, Florida area, currently over uh, uh, Russia area, right? That's Russia. Uh, so, gonna make a couple, couple of laps here before we, uh, before we actually launch to it. Uh, but uh, yeah, eventually this, this green line after it uh, has well, actually the green line is going to stay, but the Earth is going to rotate underneath that green line. And so eventually you'll see from our perspective, it looks like the green line is traveling closer to Florida. Really, it's Florida's traveling closer to the green line. Uh, but yeah, regardless, the two will sync up and be pretty close together. And that's when it's time to launch. So uh, we're going to but uh, we're not there yet. Right. So here's where the space station is currently. Uh, we'll keep we'll, come back to this a couple of times so we can kind of get a progress update on where the space station is uh is located let's see o Odie says your your training plane would fly itself in those winds yeah 100 150 mile per hour winds uh yeah i don't uh, i mean a i would not even dream of flying in winds that's that fast uh would, would not even uh consider it uh but but yeah, they would. It would definitely fly itself. If you had a headwind of 150 miles per hour, I mean, my plane stalls at 57 miles per hour. So you get any anything more than 57 miles per hour, and uh, my plane's gonna fly without uh, without doing anything. You just sit there. You don't have to have the engine on, and it's gonna fly. So, all right. There we go. Now we get a look at the dragon. Let's turn it up. Oh, we're back to grainy looking again. I don't know why it's so grainy. All right, let's turn them up. Let's see what they're saying here for today while he reads some comments here. Including uh, weather information, launch details, and uh, ga we gave them their tablets uh, that they get to bring with them mm -hmm. onto flight, uh, which brings us to the current efforts. Um, at T minus three hours and 25 minutes, we will. Uh, the, the crew began suiting up, uh, and once that process is complete, they will exit the Falcon support building and get into their Teslas. We will have two astronauts in each of the Teslas, uh, led by a support vehicle. It's a short drive up to the launch pad, and once they arrive, the crew will ascend the fixed service structure that you see there in an elevator up to the 255-foot level. The crew will then take the stairs up the last 10 feet where they will stop and make one final phone call before walking down the crew access arm to the white room. The white room is their last stop before climbing into the spacecraft, a process known as crew ingress. During ingress, the SpaceX team will run a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and vehicle interactions are all functioning properly. 
Right, and after all the vehicle and crew checkouts are completed, the SpaceX closeout team will then close Dragon's side hatch and depart the pad. At about T minus 40 minutes from launch, the crew access arm will then retract away, followed by the arming of the launch escape system. And once that arm is retracted and the escape system is armed, propellant loading on Falcon 9 will begin. At T minus five minutes from launch, Dragon will be configured for we, what we call terminal count. And this is when Dragon's onboard computers take control of the spacecraft. And finally, at T zero, Dragon and Falcon 9 will lift off from pads 39A. Roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from Falcon 9's second stage and spend the next 24 hours making its way to the International Space Station. Good morning. I'm John Innsbrucker. Hey, John. I'm Principal Integration Engineer here at SpaceX. We're currently at T-minus 3 hours, 12 minutes, and everything looks good for an on-time launch later today. Now, as Kate mentioned, the crew received their weather briefing just after T-minus 4 hours. As you can see from the view here, blue skies around Kennedy Space Center, pad 39A. Probability of weather violations is down to just 10%. Mostly we're just looking at some wind. We've also checked the ascent corridor in case of a launch escape is needed by Dragon. The sea state conditions are acceptable there. And even in the emergency deorbit locations, everything is acceptable. So the weather's looking good. Now at pad 39A, the Falcon 9 is powered up. The engine checkouts were performed overnight and pressurization of the gas storage tanks on the vehicle is completed about T minus six hours. Now, T minus two hours, Falcon will begin its final checks for launch, including a communication check with the crew, and propellant loading will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Now, as with all of our launches to the International Space Station, we have an instantaneous launch window at 11.17 a.m. Eastern, or 15 hours, 17 minutes universal time. If for whatever reason we weren't on. able to Captain launch today, our next opportunity will be minutes. just under 24 hours later on the 9th of April. That puts us 15 minutes ahead of schedule. Something about being ahead of schedule. Thanks, John. So we are just under three hours and almost 10 minutes before crew is expected uh, until launch and we're expecting the crew to walk out uh, in just a few minutes from the Falcon support building. Uh, John, as we wait for that, let's talk about any tr new traditions or celebrations uh, yeah. for Axiom leading up to launch. Yeah, yeah, of course. So as you know, uh, and as you can imagine, this has been a pretty big milestone that many at Axiom Space have been working towards for years. Uh, so we wanted to find a moment to highlight all that effort and mark a new phase of this journey that we're on together. So about two weeks ago, the Axiom family gathered together along with a crew and created a new tradition. And to mark the end of preparation of training phases and signify the first steps towards the operations phases, we held a first step to space ceremony at Axiom headquarters in Houston. Here's a quick highlight of that moment. Uh, they might have some music. Oh, really? oh, yep, sorry. They got music, so uh, can't play the music. Uh, but uh, I'll let you guys, if you guys want to check it out over at, uh, over uh, if you want to see the actual SpaceX broadcast without me talking over it, which some some people do, that's cool. Or maybe watch both of them. That would be cool, too. Um, but yeah, you can check the, uh, the video out there. I can't play the music. I don't want to get a copyright strike, but... But yeah, weather looking fantastic. Those beautiful blue skies... Uh, looking great for uh, an actual an actual launch here today. So I think we're in uh, very good shape here today uh, Let's see We'll go back to uh, oh, we missed a whole bunch of how did I miss so many comments already? Uh, let's see go back uh, Let me find where I gotta go back to Dennis, excited we're going to see a rocket launch today. Good morning to Nick. Let's see. Is this now? Says Aaron. Uh, yes. Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> yeah, yes. This this is now. This is happening now. Um, why why doesn't all why don't all rockets have the same shape? One shape must be the 100% perfect shape, right? Um yeah, so I guess you're talking about. I mean, everything's uh, everything's a little bit 
differently shaped, but I mean, for the most part, like our rockets are kind of the same shape. They're just minor differences. And, you know, that could be for uh, load bearing, you know, what kind of uh, weight it's going to take, right? So if it's a, if it's, if it's a small rocket, like a, like a rocket lab type rocket, it doesn't need to, to bear quite the load uh, that uh, a, a larger heavy lift rocket, like a, like a Falcon Heavy would have to, uh, have to hold on to. Um, so load bearing, you know, some of its design, like how they want to route the wires, what it's going to be for maintenance purposes, uh, you know, if they have to fix something or if it's reusable, like uh, the Falcon 9 booster is, you know, how are they going to get to things to uh, inspect them afterwards? So, uh, you know, some of it's trying to make drag more uh, or less of an issue, make the vehicle more efficient. All that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's pretty, they pretty much are the same shape, but you know, just minor tweaks to, uh, you know, which each company thinks that uh, is a little bit, is a little bit better. So, um, so yeah, we've got, we've still got some time. Uh, like they said, the, uh, the winds are going to be the main concern. Oh, I forgot I had this. We could take a look at this here too. Uh, also on the, not that this has anything to do with uh, what we're watching here today, uh, but, uh, also out at the launch pad right now is uh, uh, the Artemis rocket, Artemis one here, uh, or the SLS rocket. Uh, so that's kind of cool. We've got two rockets uh, on neighboring pads right there. Uh, you can see launch pad B, uh, 39B from 39A. So this is 39B, uh, which is where uh, the SLS rocket is currently uh, hanging out. Not to not to brag or anything, but I I've stood right on that launch pad. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's actually as part of the intro package. I think I think if there's video of that in the intro package, um, the intro video that plays before the stream. Um, but but yeah, that was when they were still working on it. But uh, yeah, SLS is out there right now. That's a live look of SLS out on uh, 39B, and so uh, so that's starting to become a, a reality after uh, you know a little while. <laughs> Uh, so we got SLS hanging out, getting ready, getting ready as well. Not today. It's not nothing happening today, but just thought that was cool. It has, we haven't been able to show a uh, an SLS rocket. Right, you can see there on either side. Ooh, uh, look at this. going to be walking out. That's kind of cool uh, The looking. Axiom logo patch, um, or the mission patch rather. It's fancy um, looking. And when crew comes out, they'll be greeted by a, uh, I think it's called the advanced team crew, or, or the advanced team, Kate, is that correct? Uh, so the advanced team is the group of people that are actually already out at the pad oh, right. uh, inside the tower and the capsule preparing uh, those areas for the crew's arrival. Um, that we are expecting to see the crew exit any moment. Uh, they will get into a couple of Teslas that will take them up to the pad. Um, in addition to the crew, we will also have the flight surgeon and closeout leads um, riding along in the Teslas along with our astronauts. So and you mentioned get, Kate, you know, riding the Teslas to the launch. Pad. Getting ready for uh, for walkout here. Uh, this should be a relatively short trip, so they don't have to go because this is not a nat. Oh, here they are. There they are. We are getting our first look at the Axiom One crew as they exit the suit up room. We can see there Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Aton Stiba, and Mark Pathy. This is our first live look at the Axiom One crew suited up for their mission to the International Space Station. There we go. A little they're getting a few photos together. They look ready. <laughs> what do you think perfect. they're saying? Three, two, one. That's perfect. What? I, think, I think they're saying, you know, guys, we have worked so hard to get to this point, and let's go do this. Yeah. All right. So now they're going. That's gonna, great. So now they're going to hop in. Now they'll load up here in the uh, the Teslas and a uh, pretty short trip up to uh, up to the pad. Uh, so what I started saying is uh, they don't have uh, they don't have the big long. Let's see, get rid of that. Uh, they don't have the big long trip. Uh, up to uh, up to the pad like the NASA astronauts do. Uh, the NASA astronauts have to go all the way from the Neil Armstrong checkout building, which is much further south. It's like a 20 minute drive, I think, from uh, the Neil Armstrong checkout building to uh, uh, all the way up to pad 39A. Uh, the Axiom one though, uh, it's like 
two minutes. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's what we're doing now. Uh, they're gonna drive up there now. We'll uh, they'll probably stop. Check. They'll do the. Uh, I'm guessing they'll do the whole look at look at your vehicle. That's kind of like the uh, astronaut equivalent of the the kick the tires as they uh, walk around their vehicle for inspection purposes. Uh, they'll kind of just take a peek at it. Uh, take the elevator on up to uh, the crew access arm and uh, start loading in. They should just walk. Yeah, they probably could. Well, it is kind of a long walk. The uh, it's it's deceiving, but that ramp that goes up to the launch pad. Because I've been there, you know, <laughs> not not to brag, uh, but that that ramp is huge. Like, that's a long walk. Um, so uh, like it doesn't. You don't really think it's that long, but uh, yeah, it's it, it would be a long walk, especially when you're in a spacesuit. Uh, yeah, so I don't I don't think walking is a uh, an option. Plus, they want to keep them kind of cool and relaxed. Like, last thing you want is have to is do a long walk up to the launch pad and then uh, you know be panting and sweating and. Uh, like we said, remain cool and comfortable during their ride. Um, it's same thing. It's the same so pretty much heading up here uh, right now. You can actually you can kind of see the old uh, crawler uh, crawler way there. The for the uh, the NASA crawler. So we get to get the drive out here now. Hey, my friend Marcus House in the house. Hey, Marcus. Thanks for stopping by and saying hello. Marcus just passed. What did you pass, Marcus? Was it 400,000 subscribers on YouTube? Marcus is a is a rock star. It's nice of him to come come say hello to, to us little guys here in the YouTube world. But Marcus is awesome. He's like he's one of the one of the best on YouTube. So if you don't know Marcus House and you're not subscribed to Marcus House, you better go do it now because he's an awesome guy. Uh, so yeah, they're pretty much this is. This is the base of the, the launch pad here now. So they pretty much just have to come right around. And uh, that's the uh, horizontal integration facility that they just passed where they actually, uh, you know, kind of integrate uh, the rocket and Crew Dragon capsule together. Uh, you can see they're uh, they're heading up the, the ramp here now uh, that's going up to uh, the launch pad. And there's our, there's our launch pad and our rocket. You can kind of see, you can't really see the rocket, but you can see the, the transport erector. Uh, that's, you can see the, the back of the strong back. Oh, there, you can kind of see the, you can see the rocket now. Hard to see with all that, because we do have a reused booster here today, and it is a little bit, a little bit dirty looking, so it's uh, kind of hard to see against the, the grass in the background there. But now they're they're heading over the, the crawler way tracks, and if you, you see on the crawler way, the crawler way tracks they actually they have some boards for them to drive over on the crawler way tracks there are little uh i don't even know what they are they're uh they're like these little pieces of metal that stick up uh right off the ground there and i'm assuming i've never been actually when i say i've been there i've been to 39b i've never been out to 39a so i don't know what kind of renovations they may have done out here but i'm assuming it's the same on 39a but on 39b they have like these little metal nubs that stick out of the, the ground uh, that uh, would puncture a tire. They're, uh, I don't know how to describe them. They're, I, I don't even know, I'm not entirely sure what they're what they're for. I'm assuming they're, they're, they were for the, the crawler itself, the NASA crawler, uh, but yeah, they're everywhere. There's, you know, they're spaced, you know, this far apart and there's a million of them and they're on each side. They're almost like, it's almost like a, like railroad track here kind of, but uh, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of those, and uh, they have to put some sort of boards across that so that you could actually drive across. Otherwise, you're gonna park puncture your tires. So, uh, but there they are. They made it already. So, quick trip. I imagine. Uh, so, like the NASA astronauts, they usually have a scheduled bathroom break at this point. They use the bathroom at the base of the the uh, tower here, but. Uh, a pretty quick trip for these guys, so I imagine their bathroom break is probably before they do the walkouts because it's just a just a quick trip out to the pad here. So <laughs> this guy getting a little dancing in, love it. It's that's uh, Aiton, right? Aiton Stibba, 
Is that how they said his last name? I'm terrible with names. Uh, so, yeah, there we go. We got our crew. They're going to take a look at a rocket here. It's been outstanding. You know, we, they, we, we, we mentioned earlier the There's training the lean back. that leads up to a launch. <laughs> and uh, this crew has really gone above and beyond in their training to prep for this mission. You know, 700 to 1,000 hours of training. Um, they really set that bar high for what this mission means to them and how they want to give back to the mission. And so I think it's more than fitting here to... Have a little bit of time to look back and enjoy it and say, we are ready. You know, we are ready to get up there and we are ready to go to the ISS and we're ready to participate. So with that view there, you can actually see the elevator doors that they're about to hop into. They'll get in those elevators, which I should note, um, you know, we are launching from pad 39A. Uh, this is the... This is the pad that humanity went to the moon from. Apollo 11 launched from here. Um, and, you know, the space shuttle then flew out of this pad after, after, the, after the Saturn V program ended. These guys look very excited. <laughs> like, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what's happening right now. <laughs> this is a very, that was a very extended so pause. SpaceX took over the lease for this launch pad in 2014. Uh, we did make some safety improvements and general refurbishments to the tower. So we did remove the rotating service structure. But what we see here, this is still the fixed service structure that existed uh, in the shuttle program. So these elevators that this crew is getting into, um, you know, MLA got in these elevators yeah. when he flew shuttle. Right. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Now they're going to take these elevators up to the 255 foot level. Uh, in the tower, we don't mark it by level numbers. Uh, and there we can see that they have exited the elevator. Right, we see Mark Pathy there um, uh, walking up um, uh, the rest of the service structure. Uh, well, it looks like MLA had taken a little bit of a little bit of a glance uh, out of the tower there, looking back down. <laughs> he's just allowed. Kind of, yeah, he's allowed. <laughs> he's got a bit of pedigree there. Um, but just taking a look at where he's at, you know. And and here we're going to see uh, Larry Connor and Aton Stibba riding up in the other elevator. Yeah, so they're going to go up to the 255 foot level um, and then right there we can see them ascending the final 10 feet up to the 265 foot level via a staircase. Now here they have an opportunity to use the telephone um, that is placed there. Same deal uh, as with previous space flight missions um, of history. You get you get one last chance to mm -hmm. uh, to call anyone. It's been noted that um, you know obviously we're broadcasting this live. <laughs> we're saying there's a telephone, um, but you know back in the old days, astronauts used to love to not tell people yeah. that they were gonna they could get you know a phone call before right. they got into their launch vehicle. Um, so. And then we see Aton and Larry emerging from the elevator and making their way over to the telephone as well. And Kate, look, I, I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing that uh, that advanced team, you know, following them around. Everybody's got numbers marked down. It looks like everybody here has a very specific this role to re play. This guys, reading my mind. I was just you know, about to talk and, about the number, um, the numbered uh, the uh, crew ingress, SpaceX right? sure. ninjas. Uh, there, everyone is in bunny suits. This we want to make sure that the spacecraft itself is a clean environment. You know, we are launching from Florida. There's mm -hmm. bugs. <laughs> There's no way to avoid them. Um, you know, from an atmospheric standpoint. So we. We really want to make sure that we block off any opportunity for FOD, foreign object debris, which could be a bug, could be a hair, right. you know, could be anything that's not meant to be in the vehicle. Um, and so we, we, you can actually see it in the right-hand corner. There's a small window, a rectangle, and that's basically a protective flap that blocks the uh, open environment mm. air um, from the crew access arm uh, and therefore into the white room and into the capsule. Uh, so really making sure that that environment is clean. That's why these um, our closeout leads and our suit technicians are in those uh, bunny suits that you see there with numbers on the back. It's hard to tell people apart, so you yeah. gotta, you're assigned a number. Um, and yeah, so we try to do our best here to make sure that everything that we don't want uh, to go into, ultimately to go up to the space station, you know, uh, there's, it stays out. Right. All right, so a couple of people that <clears throat> that just missed uh, who the who the astronauts are. Let me see if I can get their names correct here. By the time the broadcast is over, I'm going to have them all figured out. Uh, you got the spacecraft commander Michael Lopez Alegria, MLA. They're calling him. Uh, uh, so I think that's how you say his last name. But Alegria, Alegria, Alegria. Uh, MLA is what they're calling him uh, on the broadcast. So he's the spacecraft commander. He's a professional, a professional astronaut. Uh, he's the only one. Uh, then you've got uh, the rest of them. Pilot is Larry Connor. Uh, mission specialists are Mark Pathy 
and Aiton Stibba. Uh, so those are your those are your four astronauts that are uh, on board there. So uh, we uh, we're about to load up here now. So they're uh, they're at the the 265 foot level there, which is where uh, where the crew access arm is. That's how they get get themselves to the Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, the elevator only goes up to the 255 55 foot level. They got to take stairs. 10 feet up to get to the next level. They're making their final phone calls. This is like their final call to their family, just to be like, hey, I'm here, I made it, I'll see you in a little while. And, uh, you know, the kind of a uh, best of luck kind of thing. So uh, they're gonna head on out. They'll they'll get in, two of them will get in while the other two wait, and then the next two will get in. Uh, so they're starting to get, they're gonna start ingress here shortly. Head down that crew access arm. Kind of taking one last, one last look around. It is kind of a cool view from being up there. Remember, they're at the the 200 and what, the 265 foot level of that uh, of that uh, launch tower there. So they'll uh, they're gonna go down the uh, down the crew access arm towards the end. Uh, once they get to the white room, they'll probably sign the wall in the white room. Uh, so all the astronauts that get into the Crew Dragon capsule have all signed the wall. Uh, there's like, uh, there's a NASA logo, and I believe the other one is a SpaceX logo, uh, which is where the Inspiration4 astronauts signed. All the NASA astronauts have signed by the NASA logo, so I imagine these astronauts will sign by the uh, by the SpaceX logo. So they are, uh, they'll sign their names on the wall. And then they'll uh, they'll get in. They'll start getting strapped up. Then we we still do have a long time, right? So we're still a little almost three hours away from launch here. They've got a ton of time that they still have to um, get stuff sorted out. So they're going to do uh, leak checks in their suits. Uh, they're going to do communication checks uh, to make sure that they can communicate. There's a bunch of different channels in which they communicate on, right? So there's air to, uh, air to ground channels, which would be what they use to communicate with. While the Falcon 9 is in the air, there are ground-to-ground -ground channels. So while it's connected to the launch pad, they can connect over over ground channels, like through the actual the wiring in the crew access arm. Uh, so they'll test a whole bunch of different communication channels. There's also like satellite communication channels. They can communicate up up to space and back uh, instead of like direct from the vehicle to the ground. So there's a bunch of different communication channels they'll check to make sure they're all working. So they have some redundancy and they can make sure that Everything's working okay. So we've got uh, we've got two of them heading down the crew access arm here now. And somebody. Now the MLA and Mark have arrived as we just heard down at the white room. Uh, we can see Larry and Aton making their uh, their call, removing the gloves here to, to sign the wall. <laughs> take that sharpie and For add their sharpie, names exactly. So this is an opportunity for all astronauts that depart from pad 39A on a Falcon 9 vehicle to add their signature uh, to this room. You can see there at the left, the NASA meatball with all of the NASA astronauts that uh, <laughs> have made this journey prior. Yeah, and, and signing, signing that wall is such a huge step, you know, for any crew, I think, that gets to participate. But particularly, you know, this is the first set of signatures of many mm -hmm. for Axiom crew. and. Uh, we're really looking f forward to seeing a lot more signatures on that wall. Now, after the signatures, the closeout leads there, the suit technicians, uh, are basically, right now, we can see them doing uh, a, a pre-ingress. You can see the next two um, are making their way down, down the crew access arm. Um, yeah, that closeout lead there is doing the, the pre-ingress checks, making sure that all the zippers are closed, um, making sure that the boot covers have been removed from their boots, uh, removing the protecting the protective cap that's on top of the umbilical port. Um, if it were raining, obviously it's a <laughs> it's a beautiful day in Florida. Yeah. Um, and if it were raining, this would also be the opportunity that we would wipe the boots down right. um, before anybody enters. They're also just reminding the crew to be extremely careful when, when uh, ingressing. There is, um, we want to make sure that you know 
there's no contact between the side of the vehicle and their helmet, for example. Right. Um, so just making sure that everyone, and again, we've practiced this many times, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, the crew has logged 700 to 1,000 hours. That involves practicing getting in, getting in and out of the yeah. capsule. <laughs> yeah, but like you said- 700 to 1,000 hours, that's pretty crazy. Uh, that many that many hours for practice but i mean obviously you want to you want to have a lot of practice in but uh yes yeah, 700 to a thousand hours logged in uh in preparation time i don't know what that what exactly that involves as far as how like what what things they were uh you know is that all i can't imagine that's all simulator time or anything but uh you know i'm sure that's all uh their training time 700 to a thousand hours so uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're getting, we're starting to get uh, to the exciting parts here. So they're in the white room. They'll be ingressing into the vehicle here shortly. They generally start that here in about two minutes. It takes a little bit of time for them to get, uh, get in there, get everything situated. Uh, so, you know, we, it's probably about, I don't know, 40 minutes or so to get everybody in and situated before we get to uh, hatch closure. And first up for ingress will be Commander MLA, or Michael Lopez Alegria. You see Mark there getting a, uh, a pat on the back as well, saying, hey man, congratulations, <laughs> let's make this happen. Getting loaded up here. So basically they're, they get in their seats, um, obviously got to buckle up, like Mark Pathy is now in his seat. Mark is a so that soup technician will help them. Uh, be, it's it's more than just a, a seat belt like you mm -hmm. and I are accustomed to in a car. It's actually a five point safety harness. So they'll do an initial um, buckling in, not not to they don't they don't tighten it completely. Um, you know they want people to still be comfortable. Right. You know, they're going to be sitting in in the capsule for. <laughs> a little while, yeah. you know, <laughs> we're, we're just under three hours until liftoff. Um, so they're going to get in, tighten that safety harness, make sure that the, the footrest and everything is, uh, is comfortable for the crew. Right. Well, and one thing we didn't get to see earlier with the uh, flight suit up room, but they, you know, as they're sitting in and getting suited up, um, you know, they, they are allowed to kind of sit back in some chairs to kind of see how do these how do these chairs feel. And um, I think you told me something interesting about, you know, the seats on these Dragon spacecraft, right? They're kind of yeah, they're, customized a little bit for... Absolutely. So um, while it, they're not custom molded, mm -hmm. they are custom sized. So you can think of it as like small, medium, and large in terms of the size of the bucket that they sit in. So essentially the length of the, the seat from spine to head. Um, you know, everybody's different. And we yeah. want to make sure that, um, you know, during dynamic operations, such as liftoff and yeah. reentry, that the body is ergonomically supported. Um, and so things like that bucket seat, small, medium, a large sized, um, as well as the armrest and the footrests are all um, sized as well because yeah. uh, everybody's different <laughs> right right and and crew you know it's important for them to be as com not only as comfortable as they need to be but also for you know effective use inside inside the capsule during their journey um, you know everybody's got a different role to play uh, on the uphill and I think one of the things that is, is an important check as crew gets into their seat is not only are they harnessed incorrectly that the umbilicals are connecting correctly but also that they're comfortable yeah. you know that they have movement and range to um, you know interface with the displays and um, and everything else expected of their roles while in orbit. Absolutely. All right, so you do, I kind of wonder, uh, they've done this a couple of times. I don't know if they'll uh, continue this kind of tradition, but uh, a couple of times the astronauts have taken the uh, the name vest of their, uh, their name vest, the name plate that's, <laughs> that's Velcroed on, uh, from their closeout crew member. So you can see on their uh, the left chest area, they have their uh, Velcro nameplates there. They're Velcroed onto their suit. And uh, occasionally in the past, the, uh, the person that closes them out for each astronaut rips the nameplate off and gives it to the astronaut. The astronaut takes it with them and flies it to space and then uh, returns it to the uh, closeout crew member when they get back. So. I don't know. It almost looked like it looked like one of them might have been missing 
their nameplate. Um, so maybe they already did that. I didn't see it on camera, but maybe we'll see that here uh, here shortly. So keep an eye out on that. Looks like we're we just we got everybody in the vehicle here now. So now they're getting uh, also oh, there. You go. He just ripped the. Rip the nameplate off. See, he's got, uh, MLA's got it right there in his left hand. He's trying to find a spot for it. St oh, there you go. Uh, that's uh, Larry Larry Connor taking the nameplate off there as well. I'm gonna stick that somewhere up above. So, so there, they, they are still doing it. Ooh, kicking things here. So we've still got a couple of people asking about launch time. We still got two hours and 42 minutes. A lot of, a lot of question about like, why, why are we so uh, early in the process here? Like, why are they getting in the vehicle when there's still almost three hours to go? Uh, they're, they got to get in, get buckled. They're going to get communication checks, leak checks. They will uh, arm the launch escape system, which is important. And then they start fueling the vehicle much different than like uh, the uh, the space shuttle days where they would fuel it, get, get things kind of stable and then put the astronauts in it. Uh, the but, you know, the space shuttle didn't have a pad abort system. Right. So if if the if the space shuttle were to blow up on the launch pad, that would be the end. Uh, there was no launch escape system from the space shuttle. Right. So they they have to climb out and they'd have to run away to get away from an anomaly on the launch pad, which you know, if your rocket is exploding, uh, that's very hard to do. Uh, but they also fueled it ahead of time to get things kind of stable because fueling is considered a, uh, a, a dangerous portion of flights, right? The actual act of loading fuel in, uh, you know, that's when your fuels are kind of sloshing around and things are moving and mixing and valves are working and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, they consider fueling kind of a dangerous part of the uh, the process, but the nice thing about Crew Dragon, they fuel it after the astronauts are in. So right now, there's no fuel on board uh, the the Falcon 9 rockets. Uh, there is there's a little bit of fuel like the uh, the hydrazine that's uh, part of the launch escape system that's already in the Crew Dragon capsule that gets loaded like you know days or weeks ago um, before it's even brought out to the pad. But the the, the uh, rocket grade kerosene and liquid oxygen, that's none of that is loaded into the vehicle yet. That will be loaded in uh, starting at about 45 minutes prior to launch. So right now they put the astronauts in. It's relatively safe. There's not all that that fueling is not going on. It's not even in the rocket yet. They'll get all, get them all in and strapped up. And then they close the hatch. They arm the launch escape system and start fueling the rocket after that has been armed. That way, if something goes wrong during the fueling process, they have that launch escape system that can take them off the rocket and send them away, right? So you got, there's my little models here. My little Falcon 9 model. You got my second, here's my second stage in my capsule. So do I have the first stage? First stage is around here somewhere. I'm not sure where, but, uh, but yeah. So the second stage is like this. And uh, if something happens, it's gonna rip the, the capsule and the trunk off the top of the rocket and pull it away while the second stage and the first stage does uh, whatever it does there uh, whatever's happening that caused that to to pull away where are they launching from asked William uh, so this is launch pad 39A oh you can see uh, how do I get out of here uh, you can't see it now but uh, you can see the SLS rocket in the background so that's 39A that the Falcon 9 is on. Right behind it, I guess in this camera view, it would be to the right. Can't see, you can see the little pond there. The 39B is to the right um, towards that pond. Uh, but the SLS rocket is there uh, on the pad, hanging out. Uh, so you've got the SLS rocket out there. Uh, here's our Falcon 9. This is the camera view is gonna show the, v the, vertical uh, the vertical assembly building, the VAB, there it is right there, the big iconic NASA VAB in the background. You can see that now. That's where all the NASA offices are, like right around the vehicle, the vehicle assembly building. 
And then you've also got, I mean, the NASA complex there is pretty big. So then you've got more office buildings that are uh, further to the south as well. And SpaceX is also uh, built, they have some land uh, to the north of that a little bit. Uh, that uh, that is where SpaceX is building kind of a new operations center. It's a little bit further to the north of the vehicle assembly building. So in that view, when it kind of spun around here, uh, of course we can't see it now. It, so right in this view here, uh, right now we're looking down towards the south. This is looking at like the other launch pads. Like uh, that would be right there. You could see SpaceX's other launch pad and ULA's other launch pad, that's the one with the tower. Uh, so that's looking down towards the south. 39B would be behind this camera angle right now, which is where SLS is. So it looks like they're kind of just rotating around. So. All right, so there's our astronauts all loaded up and strapped in with their five point harnesses there. It looks like it looks like they're not entirely loaded up, or maybe they're not tightened up, because, uh... Who's all, who's all the way at the far end there? His his shoulder strap's not even over his shoulder. <laughs> What's going on there? So, that's, uh... Up at the top, I think that's, uh... Yeah, that's gotta be Aton Stibba, because you got Mark Pathy is, uh... Bottom left there, you've got uh, Larry Connor is center left. He's the pilot. Uh, center right is MLA, the commander. And uh, Aton is uh, up at the top there. Oh, there you go. His, his shoulder strap is fixed now. <laughs> it was like, that's got to get fixed, right? He's not ready. <laughs> so now they're get, getting all their gloves zipped and making sure everything's all comfortable. They got their checklist there on their pad. Also notes the on their right leg is uh, their actual uh, hookup and connection to the seat itself. So the seat that they're sitting in is almost part of the spacesuit, right? So uh, they they connect into the seat right through the through their right leg. There, they have a little port that connects them. Uh, that's uh, how they're doing all their communications is through that. Uh, they've got some environmental controls through that. Um, so they, they actually hook into the seat itself and they become kind of connected to it. So the seat is is really part of the spacesuit design as well. Uh, so yeah, it's funny. Sarah says it's funny how they they have all this support on departure, but they have to do most of it themselves on return. It is true. Uh, Kate kind of started talking about you know she was like you know these aren't regular seat seat belts you know they're five point harnesses uh so they need a lot of help getting strapped in and that was kind of what i was thinking is i was like well they do it all themselves coming back because they got to strap themselves in on the way back um but i don't know uh i imagine uh maybe i don't know maybe it's a little bit easier when you're in zero g i don't, I don't know but yeah they do have to do it all themselves on the way back i'm sure they could do it themselves now but just nice to nice to have a little bit of help trying to get uh, situated. They're also on a little tighter of a timeline. Uh, and you also, you know, when you're on the ground with gravity, it's probably a little more uncomfortable being strapped in for too long versus if you're strapped in in zero G, it's probably not as uncomfortable, right? You don't have all your weight just kind of pressing into the seat. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, might be a little, little more comfortable being strapped in for longer periods of time so maybe they could strap in earlier i don't these are this is kind of just me speculating at the moment but but yeah re regardless they do have to do it all themselves on the way home so uh let's see so we're coming up on uh communication checks here and uh probably another five minutes we'll hear that is there a movie on this flight? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It'll be, I don't imagine. They're probably not going to watch a movie during the actual ascent. But uh, we had, uh, who was that? Uh, somebody was watching like Spaceballs or something uh, while they were in space getting ready to come back. That was, that was Inspiration 4, wasn't it? Was that Inspiration 4? Somebody was watching that? I can't remember. Pretty sure that was Inspiration 4. Um... 
let's see if they show SLS here again. So you've got uh, this little drone shot coming around. Here's a, here's a look at SLS, a live look at SLS from the actual live SLS cam. But uh, let's see if they show it on this one. Swinging around. It's to the left. Keep going. Keep going. Come on. So while we were looking at this, you'll see the big water tower uh, on the right-hand side there, just to the right of the rockets. Uh, that's for the water suppression system. That will intentionally start overflowing right before launch. So if you see water start pouring out of the launch tower, uh, that's normal. Uh, they're gonna int they intentionally overflow that so it's visible visibly full um, and then all that water will rush out at uh, launch time coming out of the rainbirds which are the little uh, little like things that look like this uh, they're called rainbirds they're black right at the base of the rocket you can see there's four of them on each side uh, you can see the near ones uh, that are on the right side of the rocket there, the four rainbirds that stick out like this, that are part of the water suppression system uh, that's going to throw water at the base of the rocket. Most, not necessarily for fire, it's mostly for sound suppression, vibration suppression, right? A lot of, a lot of sound and vibrations happen because of that crazy rocket there. And so to protect, to protect the vehicle itself, to protect the launch pad, the infrastructure there, they, they're going to dump a whole bunch of water out through those rainbirds uh, to kind of dampen that... Uh, all the uh, vibrations and uh, energy from the sound of the, the rocket. Uh, and I missed, I wasn't paying attention to see if uh, SLS got shown again. Great shot there of our Looks like we're about ready to do communication checks. Getting ready for comm checks and uh, seat rotation. Now, seat rotation, so they're going to actually rotate the seats. Uh, right now, they're in kind of the ingress mode. Uh, when they're going to do seat rotation, which is where they'll kind of go more on their backs and closer to the, the screen there, which you can see above the heads of MLA and uh, Larry Connor. Uh, they're going to rotate on their backs and then up towards the, the screens a little bit. More comfortable launch position to be on your back like that. Uh, and then it also puts them in a, a better position to actually interact with the, the screens. Although the vehicle, for the most part, is flying itself, uh, they still need to be able to interact with the screens to uh, to monitor how everything is going. Let's see, uh, Sarah says, will they ever fly with all seven seats full? Uh, so NASA has no plans to do that. Um, if you recall, what Sarah is referring to is... Uh, the, the Crew Dragon capsule technically was designed with the capability of having uh, seven seats, right? So we have the four that we see now, but you could actually fit. It's hard to tell because uh, of the angle that we always see the cameras in, but there is actually enough room for another three seats underneath uh, those seats towards the bottom there. They, that that capsule is, is pretty big. Most of the time, they put all that uh, underneath there they use for cargo, especially when they're going to the space station. Like NASA has, is always going to, their plan is to always use just a four seat configuration. Stand by for umbilical comm checks. Let's listen into comm checks. On the right hand side of your screen, that is SpaceX uh, Crew Operations and Resources Engineer or CORE, Arthur Berriolt. Seated here at Hawthorne Mission Control. CDR, PLT, MS1, MS2, com check. So is the four astronauts. PLT, loud and clear. MS1, loud and clear. MS2, loud and clear. And core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check is now complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. CDR is commander, PLT is the pilot, MS1 and MS2, those are the mission specialists. Mission specialists on the outside, so you got MS1, MS2, uh, you've got the, the commander, CDR, center le uh, right, and pilot center left, PLT. It's hard, I have to 
I have to point the opposite direction that I'm that I'm saying. <laughs> the pilot center left, which I'm actually pointing to my right right now. <laughs> so I checked communications over the umbilical system. So that's that's uh, your hard line connection, your actual uh, communications through the actual hard line umbilical systems. They're doing ground to station, which uh, is uh, wireless communication. Dragon, SpaceX, com check. SpaceX Endeavor, loud and clear on the ground station. Core, loud and clear. Ground station com check is complete. Stand by for Tedris com check. Tedris is uh, the satellite, so instead of going from the Dragon directly to a ground station wirelessly, now they're going to do Tedris, which is up to a satellite and back. Getting there. Dragon, SpaceX, com check. SpaceX Endeavor, loud and clear on Tedris. And core, loud and clear. Tedris com check is complete. Stand by for com checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, SpaceX, on countdown one, com check. Good morning, Anna, here you loud and clear. Good morning. I hear you loud and clear as well. Stand by for com check over Dragon to ground. Dragon MD on Dragon to ground, com check. Loud and clear on Dragon to ground also. Good morning. MD loud and clear. Stand by for com checks with LD. So we've we've tested comms with Mission Control back in Dragon Hawk. LD on countdown one. Com check. They want good to be with you this morning. You're loud and clear. And good morning to you too, Michael. I have you loud and clear. Stand by for com check over Dragon to Ground. Dragon LD on Dragon to Ground. Com check. LD's launch director. LD. Endeavor is still loud and clear. And LD, loud and clear. Godspeed the day, fellas. Let's go have some fun. Indeed. And Endeavor SpaceX, launch configuration com checks are now complete. Please report when ready for seat rotation per section 204.100. So we're getting ready for that seat rotation we talked about a minute ago. Check to see if uh, they're all ready to go. SpaceX Endeavor, we're ready for seat rotation. So we'll see those seats rotate back and up a little bit. There'll be more on their back for for launch. Does anyone know the weather percentage for Go? Asked Sarah. So our weather, our weather uh, is predicted ninety percent favorable. 10% chance of violating launch constraints. So, uh, very good weather day today. Only 10% chance of violating our launch conditions. Main concern today is our winds, both the uh, ground level winds and upper level winds. Uh, mostly the ground level winds, but uh, upper level winds are uh, 
moderately a concern today. Keep an eye on those. The biggest, the big checkpoint is going to be once they decide to start fueling the rocket. Uh, then we'll know, uh, we'll, you know, we'll know how things are trending. They still, with winds, they still have, they have right down to uh, T minus. Over T minus two hours, 23 minutes to launch. Everything continued to go well. Be right now showing the Axiom crew inside the spacecraft. About another minute or so, we ought to begin Drag, the seat rotation. Six, we are ready to initiate seat rotation. Crew is ready. SpaceX advance team is outside of the capsule. They'll watch as we rotate the crews into the launch position. Initiating seat rotation. So I was saying about the winds, they have right up until T minus 30 seconds to scrub for winds, right? So, uh, but we'll know about T minus 45 minutes, how it's trending, because that's when they decide whether or not nice to fuel the rocket. Watching the seats rotate, the crew displays above them. So get them positioned for a launch. I'm gonna turn John down for a minute. So yeah, they, they'll make a decision at T minus 45 minutes whether to fuel the rocket. And if they decide to fuel, uh, that means they're, they really think there's a good chance. Uh, they generally don't start fueling the rocket if they, they think uh, if things aren't looking good. Uh, let's see. Did they fix the toilet on board? Yes, they did have, they had some issues with the toilet. Uh, they did fix that, uh, so that is resolved. Uh, they had some issues with uh, the system leaking underneath the floorboards, uh, which is kind of gross, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so they did. That's what we like to hear. Seats are in the launch position. We're just over two hours, 21 minutes away from the launch of Axiom-1. And as you can see, the four-person crew is in the Dragon spacecraft. They've just completed their communications checks with the ground team. Those checks verified that the communication umbilical is... The Dragon uh, With that, I can give you a go to step through Section 3, Suit Leak Check Preparation. Okay, we've heard the crew giving the uh, go ahead to do a uh, quick suit leak check. You can see them closing the visors. Uh, they'll do a uh, short, just a, a few minute check to make sure the suit integrity is good. While they're doing that, a little bit of a recap. We did hear the communications checks about five minutes ago. Went through three different paths. The umbilical that's hooked up to the Dragon spacecraft that separates right at liftoff. Comms were good there to the ground team. We also did uh, communications checks through the radio frequency transmitters, as well as the NASA tracking and data relay satellite that's up in geosynchronous orbit. So all the comp checks were good. Meanwhile, back in Mission Control, we heard uh, the Dragon team also doing the comp checks. Mission Control Center is located here in SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Meanwhile, out at SpaceX Kennedy Space Center. Sounds like we've got good suit leak checks. As I said at Kennedy Space Center, we've got the Falcon and Dragon launch teams. They're in firing room four. Got a great view of the pad on a good weather day. Copy Dragon, with that, give you a go for section four suit leak checks. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's in work. There we go call out to actually begin the timer. Speaking of the weather, you can see on the left screen, the Dragon spacecraft with the crew access arm, blue skies, uh, some light uh, clouds overhead. Weather's very good today. Probability of violation continues at 10%. Mostly that just winds, uh, but uh, nothing really to be concerned about and the trajectory out over uh, the eastern seaboard of the U.S. headed northeast also looks acceptable. And so the good news is weather is cooperating. Launch vehicle right now looking good. We're powered on, but mostly just monitoring systems. We will continue uh, checking out Falcon 9 uh, at about T minus one hour when we begin a fuel bleed in on the Merlin engines. Dragon team also monitoring the spacecraft 
They've done a lot of their significant work earlier, including pressurizing uh, the uh, Draco thruster system, uh, doing an inertial uh, measurement unit alignment. And right now they're working mostly the mechanical activities, getting the crew in, and as we'll see coming up, the uh, hatch closeout, leak checks, and then eventually at T-minus one hour, the advanced team will be leaving the pad. So right now, T minus two hours, 18 minutes, 10 seconds. All systems continue to be go for an on-time launch this morning of the Axiom-1 mission. So we're looking good. Uh, that's our leak checks we finished. Our next up is really the hatch closure, uh, which does take some time to close the hatch. And then they have to pressurize the vehicle and check for, they do leak checks on the actual vehicle itself. So that's, uh, that's going to take, uh, you know, the, that's gonna that's gonna take a little while that's uh you know over an hour here to do all that uh, so this is this is kind of the part where things start to to get a little uh <laughs> nothing to be alarmed about it's just me kicking things uh this is uh this is the part that kind of slows down a little bit here but so we're gonna kind of I, I do want to recap some of the things that we covered uh, a little bit earlier so I started showing you the trajectory here. So in case you missed it, here's our trajectory across across the uh, the globe here. So we're going northeast, of course, to meet up with the International Space Station. This is the first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station here, right? So this is going from 39A, the big launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. That's 39A. SLS is up here on 39B right now. So that's 39B. Here's 39A. Uh, we'll, we'll be launching first stage separation that will land first stage is going to come back land on a drone ship out here at sea second stage going to continue down to powered flight about here is where uh, cutoff is and then it'll be in orbit right and then it'll the job will be to chase down the international space station and dock with that so uh, yeah heading up to the northeast and that's because the international space station is on that similar path here so we're checking in with our international space station the current location of the international space station is right here just off the western coast of south america here so uh, we'll start to see this green line get a little bit closer to florida by the time uh, two hours and 15 minutes is up when uh, launch time is. And and actually, the green line is not moving. It's Earth that's rotating underneath it. So Florida will get closer to the green line. But uh, yeah, it's just hard to think about it that way. But yeah, it's really, it's Florida getting closer to the green line. So, uh, so once we get, once Florida gets lined up with the orbital path, then, uh, then we launch. We'll be chasing down that International Space Station. This will be, like I said, it'll be a little bit more closely aligned by launch time. A uh, couple of couple of questions that I saw come in. These these kind of always come up uh, during uh, during these launches here. A um, lot. Of, there's always the bathroom question. There's questions about do they wear diapers? Uh, we don't. There is. There is a, a bathroom. There's a toilet, right? But we've I did a whole. Uh, there's a whole video that I did about the SpaceX Crew Dragon toilets. The, so there is a toilet on board. Um, they can't use that toilet right now. They can't use it until they get to orbit. But it is one of the first systems activated when they get to orbit. Uh, it is kind of a common theme uh, that a lot of astronauts have always reported. We're, we're gonna. This is gonna be bathroom talk here. So you know, if you get grossed out by that, this is your warning. Um, but Anyways, astronauts have have frequently reported that uh, one of the first things that they have to do is activate the toilet because when astronauts get to space and you get into that weightlessness environment, it seems like almost everybody has the urge to, or the need to, uh, to, to urinate when you get to space. Uh, all your fluids shift around and uh, that's, that's what you got to do. So it is one of the first systems activated. They can use the toilet once they get into orbit and can get unstrapped. Um, the... The, the flip side of that, you know, the other uh, the other aspect of the toilet, they can, you know, do their their business, you know, in other ways. But uh, astronauts have reported discussion. First time flyer in order to build a foundation for piloting Crew Dragon. Let's see. Is it? Also served as the translator for his oh, I think. Well, uh, it looks like it's working there. And as I still don't have chat. Unable to chat. Unable to connect to chat. Try again. Let's see. Refresh. Oh, there it is. Okay. 
a suite of other tools at their disposal uh, to support the crew members throughout. Back. The all right. Everybody says I'm back. Okay. Yep. Sorry. All right. Right, but you know their training doesn't stop there. Right. They had a lot that they had to cover. Got it. So the X1 crew uh, has also. Okay. I think everything is. I think everything's back. With a microgravity environment. Am I? Am I here? <laughs> We're back. Okay. Ah. Uh, yep. All right. Well, I've been. I've been having an issue lately with uh, my uh, my internet connection, so I think we're back here now. I'm I'm showing all, all my stats are back to normal. Was it the thing you kicked? No, it wasn't. The, it wasn't the thing that I kicked. Um, I have. Well, this could be a long. This is kind of a long discussion, which is probably uh, not what people really care about. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I updated. Uh, this is getting way too technical, but. Anyways, I updated the firmware on my, uh, uh, basically my network router and uh, my mesh network at home here. Uh, and ever since then, like I, I probably should revert back a, a, uh, a firmware version, but ever since I updated the firmware, uh, every couple of hours, like it doesn't happen super often, but every couple of hours, it will just completely drop my entire internet connection for just a brief window for you know what was that like you know 15 or 20 seconds uh but it's super annoying and i kind of forgot about that actually for today <laughs> should have i should have reverted back a firmware version but yeah ever since i did that uh it, it's a uh it, it drops my internet connection like you know every uh it's usually uh, well i only notice it like maybe once a day but yeah, it's like one one or two times a day, it will uh, just drop my entire connection for uh, you know twenty seconds or so. Yeah, Sarah says I hate rolling back firmware. I do too. I was kind of hoping that like instead of having to roll back the firmware to a previous version, that I could just update. Like maybe they'll come out with a new firmware version, and I could just update and fix it. Uh, but yeah, so. Uh, yeah, if I if you lose me for <laughs> 20 seconds, uh, it's because the firmware on my mesh network uh, is just hates me right now. So, yeah, that's where I that's where I went for a little while. <laughs> I just sitting here going like, ah, oh, yep, and I have no internet connection and it's gone. And I just have to I just have to wait. Can you just reflash the new firmware and see if it works better? Uh, maybe I could try that. It's his AOL connection. Yeah. I do not have an AOL email address. Never have. <laughs> ah. Anyways, all right. What were we talking about? I don't remember what we were talking about. Um. Oh, we were talking about the bathroom uh, situation on uh, Crew Dragon. So don't use dial-up to update. Yeah. I don't have dial-up either. I do actually have a pretty good internet connection. Uh, it just uh, is very unreliable right now, thanks to my uh, thanks to my my router. So, uh, oh, okay, toilets. Right, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So I think I, we talked about astronauts frequently have the the uh, the need to urinate when they get to space. I think I started saying that it's very infrequent for astronauts to have the need to uh, defecate when they get to space. So. Um, so they generally don't have to use, I mean, it's all the same system, but, uh, they generally don't have to use the toilet for that when they're going to the International Space Station, because it's, uh, relatively quick to get to the International Space Station, and they really don't need to, to use that portion. They can save that for the ISS. Uh, but, uh, like the Inspiration Crew, or Inspiration 4 crew, they were, they didn't go to the space station, so they had to, uh, they have to use that, uh, that portion the toilet for that portion so anyways there is a toilet the question is do they wear diapers during launch uh we don't nobody has really given us an official answer on whether or not they have to wear diapers for launch um so uh so yeah we don't uh we don't know um the diapers they, that would be the uh the the mags the maximum absorbency absorb maximum absorbency garments 
uh, this is basically adult diapers. Um, do they wear those during launch? I, I don't know. Like, it's relatively quick to get to launch, right? So they, they went to the bathroom at about uh, T minus three hours. In theory, they're going to be in orbit, uh, you know, at about two hours and 15 minutes or so from now. So really, they only got to hold it for about, you know, say three and a half hours. Which, I I don't know, that's kind of like, that that could be a long time, right? Like, you know, I've I've been in, uh, I'm going to talk about my flying, I've been in my airplane, and I've flown for three hours, and uh, I, there's been times where you get to three hours, and you're like, mm, man, I uh, can't wait to get on the ground, because, uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta make a stop here. So, like, three hours could be, that could be a long time. So, I kind of tend to think that, like, yes, they do wear it. Because what's the harm? Like, why would why would you not wear it? I guess is in my head, I'm like... Like, are the chances that they would use it, probably pretty low. But really, it's kind of like, well, why not? Why? I don't know. So, I tend to think that they do wear mags for launch as as a a backup right you, the worst you like worst case scenario you're sitting there on the pad there's 15 minutes prior to launch and somebody's going like mm, i really like they can't focus on what they're supposed to be focusing on because they're like man i really gotta really gotta go so i tend to think that yes they do have mags on adult diapers so that's just my speculation they've never confirmed that so i have noticed uh, since my drop in internet connection here, uh, let's see. You guys all stare at uh, stare at the SLS for a minute because now my stream is not live anymore because of our internet hiccup. Let's get ourselves situated. Now I'm like 30 seconds off. How did that happen? Let's see if we can get this uh, back to somewhere reasonable. So, well, I, I guess I have to... Huh, well, that's slightly annoying, but I, I guess I'm good, just going to need to update my... our clock and make it... No, this way, this way. Nope. This way, save. No, hold on. Let's see. We gotta get the. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to get the clock updated so that they match. And I think it's. There we go. All right, so there, my clock matches their clock. All right, so we're better now. Let's get our clocks in sync. We we got uh, we got all uh, discombobulated there when we we dropped our internet connection. So, anyways, all right. Uh, William says, "Is it? It is really windy in Florida. How are the upper level winds?" Oh, good segue there, William. Let's take a look at our weather conditions here for today. So. We'll start with our uh, our ground level winds here. So actually, we'll even refresh so that we get the latest uh, latest conditions or latest forecast for eleven o'clock, which is our launch time, two hours from now. So if we uh, if we scroll in here to uh, the coast, about twenty mile per hour winds right now, right on the coast in uh, in Florida. So those are some pretty strong ground level winds. Not crazy strong. I think usually we look at canceling when we start to get up to like thirty. 30 plus mile an hour winds on the ground uh, but these are this is constant winds so we don't we're not really factoring in wind gusts so if we look at wind gusts uh they're still looking at uh let's see maximum wind gusts since 2 a.m 25 miles per hour so it looks like it's 20 gusting to 25 it's in miles per hour can we change it to uh i'm gonna change it to knots maybe what what's the best uh what's the best unit knots kilometers per hour what do you what do you want to know it in so 21 uh gusting to 21 uh, so we're we're 16 15 16 gusting to 21 knots of uh wind speed 
on uh, on the ground here. Let's we'll do it in kilometers per hour. That's uh 20 to have 30 kilometers per hour gusting to uh gusting to 40 kilometers per hour. So that's our current wind speed uh, that's on the ground level, right? So if we go up to uh, our upper level winds, which also are a moderate concern here for today, you can see if we zoom out here to give you kind of a bigger picture, uh, you can see that the upper level winds, we got kind of two two streams of upper, uh, upper level uh, jet streams here that are kind of converging. So we've got the northern jet stream like this and a southern one here. Uh, so you've got this northern horseshoe here uh, that's to the north and you've also got this one here but they're both pretty much converging over florida right now so we're talking upper level winds for 11 o'clock 140 miles per hour uh that's uh some pretty strong uh pretty strong winds there Oop, we gotta keep it on here um so 140 miles per hour right over the launch pad. I mean, it pretty much passes through the upper level winds pretty quickly. So we're talking 145, maybe 150 mile an hour winds, which is is pretty strong. That's right around the area where we start to see concern about uh, about scrubs. But uh, it's not just it's not just the speed that's a concern, right? Wind shear is what we're concerned about. Wind shear is a dramatic change in speed or direction. So if it just gradually goes from 20 to 150 in a relatively smooth and stable manner uh then you're uh then you're okay from a wind shear standpoint um so because you're not really getting a, a shearing effect of that wind from a speed as far as speed's concerned and if if the direction is relatively stable as well you're also uh you're also okay from a shearing standpoint so um, if you get a dramatic change in speed or direction that's where you're going to be concerned about wind shear. Right? So we've got, uh, let's see, is there like a proc chart or something that I can pull up on here? No, I can't, I can't pull that up on here. Uh, we can look at the uh, pressure system. So it looks like we got uh, like a low pressure system up here uh, in the uh, Michigan area. You could probably even look at this by, uh, by winds as well. Yeah, you can see uh, see we've got this this system up here to the north. But anyways, our winds are our winds are the main concern concern for today. But I still I don't think it's a, a huge concern. We're still ninety percent go for the day. But that ninety percent does not include upper level winds. They don't factor in upper level winds in that in that number. So. Uh, let's see. One other thing to look at here. Uh, let's uh, we get rid of some of these extra things. Uh, we'll take a look at our. Uh, do we want uh, no no no? Let's see. I'm gonna turn on uh, the yeah. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to show here is our dragon landing areas. So. All our purple pins here. This is uh, our possible dragon, uh, or dragon recovery areas. So if we have to see, uh, if we have to recover dragon for an abort scenario, uh, or also when it actually does come home in a nominal fashion, uh, these are kind of the areas that it would come come in at. So we have uh, starting over here. We've got a couple of sites over in uh, the Gulf of Mexico that we can recover at. So we've got uh, the Pensacola recovery site here. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, what was this? Crew two that recovered that landed out here. Uh, Demo two landed out here. Uh, we've got the uh, what do we call this one? This is the uh, Panama City recovery location. Uh, and this was uh, what was this? Crew one landed out here, the Panama City recovery area. We've got uh, this this area here, which is the Tallahassee recovery area. We haven't had anybody land there yet. We also got what's this the tampa recovery area uh we've had uh this was uh crs 21 landed out in the tampa area this is cr actually crs 22 landed in the tallahassee recovery area 
Uh, then you've got uh, some locations out here. You've got uh, right off the uh, coast of Cape Canaveral. We've got where in, this is where Inspiration 4 landed. It's right off the coast. Uh, you've got uh, CRS 23 landed up here, Daytona area. And uh, out here, this was Demo 1, which land, they wanted to land a, a little bit farther away from land for Demo 1 for a uh, little safety that safety margin uh but uh but yeah you get uh these are uh somebody who just said that uh justin justin gibbs said uh i didn't realize that dragon splash down so close to land which is true like dragon splash is down way closer to land than anything uh you know than the other prior capsules like uh you know apollo gemini mercury all those all those splash down like way way out in the pacific in the middle of nowhere uh so they were they were way out here for safety reasons. I mean, now we've kind of we've kind of nailed down our recovery uh, process and our control of the vehicle that they can actually recover much closer to land now. Like it's, I mean, remember we had uh, remember the demo one days out here in Pensacola. We had uh, all those recreational boaters that were on site for. <laughs> for the demo one recovery right the the whole capsule was surrounded by recreational boaters they just took their boats out and they were like yeah we'll uh, we'll meet you there guys we'll see you. we'll see you at the recovery sites uh and so yeah it's close enough where you know recreational boaters could just jump in their boat for the day and be like let's go we're heading out uh they couldn't do that in the apollo era like i mean it was way out there like you couldn't you couldn't take a, a you know a little fishing boat that far out uh so it was dm2 oh what did i say? did i say demo one yeah demo two the one with bob and doug did I, did I say demo demo one i meant demo demo two i always i always say demo one because it makes me think it's the first astronaut flight but demo one you're right demo one was uncrewed it was demo two demo two that landed that uh, had all the uh, recreational boaters uh so yeah it we're definitely a lot a lot closer a lot closer to shore than uh than we were way back in the day so all right so it looks like we've got hatch closure has taken place they've uh they've closed it up and right now they're gonna do uh leak checks on the actual capsule itself uh so they'll uh make sure that uh the door is completely sealed uh if you recall that might have also been on demo two uh, or maybe it was Crew 1. I can't remember which one it was, but one of those, Demo 2 or Crew 1, I think it was Demo 2. They actually had to reopen the hatch uh, because they got some FOD, some foreign object debris on the seal of the hatch. So they were, they closed it, sealed it up. They started doing their pressure checks, their leak checks, and something wasn't right. It wasn't, it wasn't sealed. So they had to reopen the hatch, inspect the seal, and they found some uh, some debris, the foreign object debris, FOD, uh, on the actual seal of the door. Had to clean that off, seal it again, rerun the, the pressure check, and uh, and then it held and it was just fine. But uh, but uh, Sarah says I think it was Crew Two. Yeah, I was. I can't remember which which uh, flight it was, but yeah, one of one of the recent flights. They sealed it. They had to open it back up, clean off the seal and then close the hatch a second time. They had to do it twice. Uh, let's see, uh, under two hours, wondering how they're feeling right now. Right now, it's probably a little bit relaxing, right? So from a crew standpoint, I imagine that, you know, they've kind of done a lot of the bulk of the work that they have to do. So now it's like monitoring, they're keeping an eye on checklists, and now they, they kind of just chill, right? They're just gonna kind of hang out wait for uh wait for things to uh to develop here let's see do i have let me uh i want to try i don't think that's gonna work go back here this one no that's not what i want i thought maybe one of those would work let's just go to this one I was gonna try to try to make one of these uh, screens bigger so we didn't have just all this blue space around. 
But I don't think... I don't think any of these will... will work, right? Maybe this one? Oh, actually. It does kind of work. Or this one? Yeah, all right. There you go. That's a little better. Then we can get... Uh, then we can get a better view. I can control it. We don't have all that, that white space. Or maybe... Go this... This way or this way. What do we want to see? What's more interesting, the astronauts or the closeout crew? I suppose we'll, we'll switch back and forth between the two. For now, we'll keep an eye on the, the closeout crew, see what they're up to. Actually, let's keep an eye on the astronauts. We'll see what they're up to. We'll watch them. And actually, you know what we should also do? I'm going to move. Uh, let's see. Oops. Not wrong button. I'm going to move. It. Oh, no. Don't do that. Don't do that. I need both of these things. Got two. Can I move them both at once? Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna move. Let's see. We're going to produce on the fly here. What? What? Uh, there. Do that. I suppose I could produce this without you guys seeing it. <laughs> but where's the fun in that? Because I could go into like I could go in this mode, but it, it's hard to it's hard to do that in real time. So we're just gonna leave it. We'll leave it like that for now. And we can see our astronauts and what they're up to. Okay. Studio mode is so small. I know. Studio, we put it in studio mode, and it's it's very hard to see to see what I'm doing. I need a I need to be like split screen studio mode. Uh, what what software I use it? I just use OBS. So this is a everything's produced in OBS here. So all right, let's. Uh... Oh, now of course they're gonna do a. Uh... We're gonna do a package here. Let's do uh, da, 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 this one. They were seeing some uh, leak rate trending in the wrong direction, so we're going to reopen the side hatch temporarily, uh, try and clean off that seal, and then reclose the side hatch to reperform the side hatch leak check. I'll copy. Ah, see. Okay, Arthur, we copy that. All right, so that was just a note from so we just, SpaceX. We just said that just a minute ago. They were they were doing the leak check. They were seeing the the uh, leak check trending in the wrong direction, meaning that it wasn't holding uh, the pressure that it was supposed to. So they are going to reopen the side hatch and clean the seal. So we just talked about that. Uh, so yeah, they are they're going to uh, they're going to try that again. We just talked about how they did that. Um, so, and this is why there, this is one of the main reasons why there's so much time between hatch closure and the actual fueling, right? We have an hour to go before, uh, before fueling happens. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons is to build in some of this time so that they can, if they do have a, a, an issue, a leak issue like this, they can, they can, uh, address that. So they're, they're going to have, they basically have to redo the uh, the hatch closure uh, because they're gonna have to clean that seal so so but not a big deal I mean we still got there's still plenty of time luckily they have time built into the into the timeline so that uh, this this is uh, something that they can deal with not uh, without much of an issue Uh, the hurry, the, yeah, Wild West Dan says the hurry up and wait game is there for a reason. Right, it's, it, they have got some time built into, the, a buffer time built in for stuff like this. Now, if they really have an issue and it's still not sealing after their second time, like, then they're going to start to run short on the timeline. Sarah wants to know what the zero-G indicator they have. Always a highlight. Yeah, I have no idea on the zero-G indicator. I don't have any of my zero-G indicators. You can... You can, uh, if I switch over to this view, you can see in the background, we got a uh, little 
baby Grogu here uh, that was... Oh, man, which, I'm losing track of which one was for which mission. You've got Tremor. You can't really see Tremor, but you can see the sparkles off of Tremor. Tremor is right here. All these little sparkles all over my shoulder, that's Tremor. That was from Demo 2. Uh, that, these are Tremor's eyes, <laughs> or maybe sparkles or something. I don't know what they what they are. Um, so that's Tremor. That was one of the zero-G indicators. you got uh, Baby Yoda, Grogu here. Uh, that was another zero-G indicator. Uh... What were the other ones? Oh, Earthy. Earthy's right here. There's Earthy. Uh, or Space Kirby, as I call him. Uh, he's right there. So I, I have three of the zero-G indicator. Right? I don't have any others, do I? No, oh, I think that's it. That's all I got. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are back back there as well. But uh, we don't know. I don't know what the zero-G indicator will be uh, for today's flight. But there's three of them back there. One there. Two, right, oh, oh, right there. Earthy is my favorite, says Anita. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, can we? Anita says, can we still call him Baby Yoda, please? <laughs> yeah, those are definitely. Uh, I like all three of those. I like Tremor, Earthy, Space Kirby, or uh, Baby Yoda. All three of those. I, I love them all. Um, all right, so I think uh, I think what we ought to do for just a brief moment while we got some downtime while they're messing around with the hatch closure, we've been going for uh, two hours here now. I think we ought to take a brief moment so I can refill the airplane cup with some coffee. That's it. That's the end of my coffee. Now everybody knows how airplanes fly. Air and magic. Um, so we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take like a 10 minute break so that I can go refill my coffee. And uh, then we'll come back. Uh, we got about. We still have an hour to go before uh, the real action. The real action starts. Right. The the big. Uh, the big action packed part of the this sequence is going to be uh, starting at about 45, 47, 45 minutes, right in that range. So they're going to do a weather, a final weather briefing happens at a T minus one hour. So obviously that's 44 minutes from now. Uh, we've got uh, ISS position sync. That's what's coming up next. They, they kind of synchronize the position, the exact position of the ISS with the onboard computers of the Crew Dragon capsule. So that they have that all up to date. Um, so that that's just kind of an electronic thing that, that comes up uh, about hour and 10 minutes before launch. We've got a weather briefing in an hour. Then they'll make that go, no go decision to start fueling the rocket. And that's when things really start to happen pretty quickly. So that's going to happen in about T minus 48 minutes. Uh, then they're going to retract the crew access arm. They arm the launch escape system and then uh, we start fueling it. And then things go by real fast after that. So. Uh, so yeah, we've got, this is kind of a lull in the timeline here for the next hour. I think it's a good time to take a, take a break. We'll all go uh, have our, as uh, RC Flyer Tube says, uh, take a bio break. We'll, uh, you know, refill your coffee, get your tea, get your, uh, you know, have a, have Anita's having a banana twist milkshake. That sounds actually fantastic. Uh, but uh, yeah, get your, uh, get your refreshments reset the clocks here and uh, get yourself ready for uh, an actual launch here in uh, T minus an hour and 40 minutes. So, so yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll take a little bit of a break. We'll continue the stream. I'll, I'll let SpaceX's stuff keep on going here. Uh, I'm kind of waiting for them to finish this little packet, the little package they're doing here because it has a bunch of music and I don't want to walk away while they're playing music that I'm going to get a copyright strike against. So, um, so uh, we're going to, as soon as they finish this, I guess is when I'll take my break here. But are we doing another joyride today? Uh, yeah, this is kind of, this is kind of like another joyride. Uh, I mean, it is, but this is a, 
This is less of a joyride and more of a uh, of a of a, a business purpose, right? So uh, the Inspiration Four mission was kind of like a, a joyride, basically. Like, I mean, it did have uh, it, it did have some very real, um, you know, b benefits, obviously, for the the whole St. Jude's Hospital and the the fundraising bits and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's that there was a tremendous amount of good that came out of it. But in the end, like mission wise, uh, that was, that was something that, uh, that was really just kind of a joy ride. They went up to space, they hung out for a couple of days and they came back. Um, I mean, they did, they definitely did some science, uh, right? They did, uh, um, they, they did do a little bit of, uh, of medical study on board, but, uh, they kind of just went up and came back. It was paid for by Jared Isaacman, um, you know, nothing against, like, I, I think it's perfectly fine to do that kind of stuff. Um, but this is, because Axiom 1 is kind of setting up, like, a business model, right? They are they are going to the International Space Station for eight days. They're coming back. Like, this is almost like a, uh, instead, of, like, I wouldn't call it a, I wouldn't call this so much of a joyride. I would call this more like a, a new industry, right? So, like, this is a, this is a business. Like, now they're, they're trying to send private astronauts to the International Space Station and offer this as a business. We talked earlier, Tom Cruise is potentially going up on a future Axiom mission to go film a movie on the International Space Station. Like, imagine having an actual movie. Like, we've had plenty of movies about space and, you know, they have to kind of simulate space flight here on the ground while they're, while they're filming it. But imagine having an, a movie filmed actually in space. Like, you no longer have to simulate zero gravity. Like, you could just film it and it's like you're... You got it. Um, be cool to see that in an actual movie. I mean, we see it. Obviously, we get like the NASA videos with the, all the speckly uh, dead pixels and stuff uh, from the International Space Station. But um, but yeah, it'd be cool to see like a full on film, uh, full on feature film that was actually filmed on the space station would be cool. Um. All right. Well. Let's see, are they... Yeah, they're still playing music. I can't go away yet. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna take our break, but I'm just waiting for them to finish this package of... See, they're probably taking their break right now, which is why they're running all these packages. Uh, all these, you know... Let's see, they're going to go on to somebody. How many How many have they done? Is Mark the last one? They're doing Mark Pathy's uh, little... Uh, introductory package here now so when they when they finish him his then we'll uh we'll go on the break so then i can switch over without uh risk of playing their music uh let's see richard i thought russia had previously sent up a movie crew what makes this uh what makes this the first private mission wasn't that private film crew the first uh, i guess i'm not as familiar with uh the uh, Russian mission, but uh, I believe this is... Well, so this is the first all-private mission, right? So uh, I don't believe that we've had a a Russian uh, all-private crew, right? So then they, then they go up... They went up with another Russian cosmonaut. Um, but uh, this would be... This would be the first all-private crew to the International Space Station. Um, and I don't know anything about their film, uh, the, what they, uh, what they filmed up there, I guess in my head, I'm thinking like, you know, Hollywood film with, uh, you know, kind of your, uh, your mainstream, your, you know, mainstream actors that, I don't know, to me, Tom Cruise, well, Tom Cruise is a, uh, household name to me. I don't, uh, especially, well, especially with Top Gun, the new Top Gun movie coming out soon. Right? Who's anybody else excited for the new Top Gun movie? Because I am. All right. Uh, The real, the real YT. 
excited. Wild West Dan's excited for the new Top Gun. I'm pumped for the new Top Gun. That's, that's only like a month and a half away. I've watched the original Top Gun like probably a million times. <laughs> More so now. I was actually going to watch it again the other day because I haven't. It's been a little while since I've watched the original Top Gun. I haven't watched it since I started flying. You know what we ought to do. I was going to take a break at this point, but we're waiting for. I'm waiting for them to finish all their uh, their uh, packages on that they're doing about all the astronauts. But in the meantime, why don't we watch a why don't we watch a flying video? Oh, they're about to finish here now. Oh, let's listen Six to John. Six minutes, 27 seconds. As the Axiom 1 crew awaits its 11, 17, 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time liftoff from Launch Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Now, currently, as uh, you see a little bit on the left there, the crew is inside the Dragon capsule. We closed the side hatch a little bit earlier. We began the five-minute leak check. Uh, we stopped that. They saw a little bit of a leak and they reopened the hatch starting about 12 minutes ago. You can see they're getting ready to close the hatch again. Uh, they cleaned the seal off. Uh, nothing significant noted, but uh, give it a good wipe. We're closing up and then we'll try to repeat the leak check here very shortly. Once we get through that, we're also waiting to hear the crew perform communications checks with the Falcon ground team. Uh, that'll be a check out with some of the responsible engineers who you'll also hear during the ascent calling out status, propulsion engineer, avionics engineer, guidance, nav, and control, uh, as well as chief engineer. Earlier, we did have the communications checks with the Dragon team. We heard that going through a variety of routes. Uh, that would be the umbilical, uh, the radio frequency transmitters, and of course, the NASA TDRS satellite up in geosynchronous orbit. So currently the weather, uh, when we get a view of the pad, the weather continues to be go for launch, uh, as well as any contingencies. For example, if a launch escape was required during ASCET, weather conditions in the Atlantic Ocean off of the eastern seaboard of the U.S. as we head northeast towards the space station, those conditions are go. Uh, the upper altitude winds for Falcon 9 as we steer through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, those also look good right now. And of course, contingency uh, splashdown locations uh, that we would use in case the crew had to come back down out of orbit, they're also looking good. Now coming up in about 35 minutes, that's when things start to get active on Falcon 9. We'll begin the fuel bleed in on the Merlin engines, uh, let a little bit of propellant onto the vehicle, bleed it through the engines, that's getting them ready for the ignition sequence inside of T minus two seconds. And of course, as we said, the Dragon uh, team, the advanced team that's on the pad, they have to repeat the side hatch leak check. Good news is we've still got time in the schedule, uh, and we have seen this before. If you've been with us on one of the crew missions, we also had a leak where we had to reopen the hatch, clean the seal, close it up, and then it passed. But that advanced team, once we get through that and we finish putting on the last covers for flight, uh, deflate some of the seals, uh, and get ready to... Uh, uh, get out of the pad, they'll leave uh, the pad area and the crew access arm at T minus one hours. Also, a little bit earlier, we did a launch escape system checkout on Dragon. That came at about T minus one hour and 52 minutes. That's mostly just checking all the telemetry of the systems that are required in the launch escape safety system. Everything checked out well, and that's a standard part of the launch countdown. It's critical to make sure that everything is in working order. We are closing the side hatch again, and we'll step into the next round of side hatch leak checks. Copy on SpaceX. And we've heard the call out. Uh, you can see the advanced team. They, they're closing the hatch. Uh, looks like they're uh, torquing up uh, to the required uh, uh, load. Uh, we then begin a pressurization sequence for a few minutes, and then we hold it for five minutes. And then, fingers crossed, we'll get a successful leak check. We'll get into the communications checkouts and proceed on to the T-minus one hour and uh, countdown to an on-time launch. But right now, Kate, John, everything continues to look good out of Pan 39A. We have to recommence the help checks for the launch escape system with the second hatch closure. Expect a momentary flight computer state change. Hmm, interesting. 
And one other update, uh, you just heard the launch escape health checks. Those are the ones I said that we did about 20 minutes ago. Uh, you do them as you close the hatch. Now that we open it up, we close it again. They'll repeat that checkout. Uh, that just takes a minute to verify all the telemetry on the launch escape systems are still within specification. So everything continuing to go well at 39A, other than working through a second hatch leak check. Fingers crossed that we'll see an on-time launch at uh, 11, 17, 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. So as John and I said, we have, um, we're, we're now in the process of redoing the side hatch closure and leak check. Um, so the team uh, saw a little bit of uh, loss of pressurization whenever we were conducting that leak check. Um, not a huge deal, just reopen it. They wiped down the, the seal itself, uh, didn't really know anything significant. So now they have reclosed it and we're now re-performing that leak check. The crew remains seated and comfortable there on the right-hand side of your screen uh, inside uh, Dragon Endeavor. Yeah, well, as we wait for that. Uh, All right, so uh, they're gonna recheck here. Um, Wild West Dan asks about the actual uh, ISS docking. So the docking is uh, scheduled for tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. So it is about a uh, little less than 24 hours uh, docking is 6.45 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow, so launch today is uh, is 11, 11.17 a.m. Eastern time, so uh, it's not quite 24 hours, but uh, yeah, the docking's going to happen uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so they'll, uh, they'll uh, be in the uh, Crew Dragon capsule for uh, a little while, a couple hours, uh, to get uh, caught up with the ISS and then get docked. Um, all right, well, now they are, uh, I think we may, I think I might do that break here now so I can refill my coffee here while we have a second. So we got an hour and a half, an hour and a half to go to launch in about 45 minutes. Uh, about 45 minutes, we will, uh, start the fuel up process, assuming that the leak checks go well the second time around here. And, uh... Then, uh, then we'll, then we're really gonna be rocking and rolling here. So, so let me jump away here for a minute. I'm gonna refill my coffee. Probably be a short break. We'll keep it going uh, on the NASA stream here, so you can hear everything that's happening, and uh, you guys can go refill your coffee, your tea, take your bio breaks, whatever you got to do. Um, and uh, we'll be back here in uh, in just a minute to uh, continue continue the coverage of uh, the Axiom One mission to the International Space Station. All right, we'll see you guys in a bit. Don't go anywhere. See you soon. T.axiumspace.com for more info over the coming days. And that's where you're going to find the QR code to the augmented reality spacewalker. So again, head to nft.axiumspace.com, scan the QR code, go have some fun, play with the spacewalker, put them wherever you want and have a blast with them. Super cool. Yeah. So uh, just a quick check-in. You can see there Falcon 9 remains on the pad. We are continuing to count down to our liftoff uh, at just under one hour and 30 minutes from now. As you can see on the right-hand side, the crew are in their seats uh, and the team on the left is conducting the leak check of that side hatch. Uh, for those of you that have just joined us recently, we did uh, attempt to close the side hatch earlier, closed it, um, but when we performed that leak check initially, saw a uh, very small lo loss of pressure there. So we, we reopened it and then the teams wiped down the seal, inspected it, um, didn't really know anything major, yeah. so closed it back up and uh, we're now performing that leak check once again. Um, the process for that is basically we inflate the seal that is around the side hatch um, and we leave it inflated for five minutes. We monitor uh, that pressurization and uh, once it holds that pressure for five minutes, um, we get the, the green light. Yeah, you know, and as John and I mentioned earlier too, you know, it's not uncommon for things like this to happen. And that's why we have checks in place and we have things like verifying end items. And you know, that's a huge part of what the ground control team here plays is, you know, verifying that 
uh, those leak rates like what you talked about. You know, are you holding a leak rate for the right amount of time and at the right pressure? And what does your trending data look like? So, you know, it's all part of the huge network of teammates on the ground that are uh, supporting the mission and just making sure that every step along the way is safe. And Dragon SpaceX for post ingress briefing. All right, MLA, uh, while we continue through the side hatch leak check, it continues to look like a great day to fly. Dragon, Falcon, and 39 Alpha all look good to fly. Systems are nominal, and we have no deltas to the pre-briefed emergency deorbit sites. That's about as good as report we can ask for, thanks. Ah, I concur with that. And for awareness, we will be stepping into Falcon 9 op operator comm check shortly. Come. All right, that voice that you just heard uh, was Arthur Berrialt, our uh, SpaceX core, who uh, basically is the primary communicator uh, between the teams here on the ground and the crew. Um, really important role because, you know, for us, we can we can see what's going on. We, we've got the views here, um, but think about it for the crew. Um, you know, they can't they can't really see what's on the other side no. of that side hatch. So um, important updates there to keep them informed. Uh, that being said, you know, Dragon, GNC will begin the uh, Falcon 9 operator comm check with you at this point. Go ahead, GNC. Dragon GNC on countdown one, comm check. You're loud and clear, Cyrus, how many? GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by propulsion engineer. Dragon, prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, Endeavour, you're loud and clear, Charles. Prop, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Endeavour, good morning, Colin. Avionics, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Good morning, ground segment has you loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Launch control, endeavor, you're loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, comm check uh, from chief engineer. Good morning, Chief Engineer. This is never your loud and clear. This completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineering Comm Checks. Godspeed. Thank you. All right, there you just heard the completion of the comm checks. Uh, basically, the ground teams, the various uh, leads for the ground systems here, um, going around and um, making sure that the communication pathway to the crew is clear, loud and clear, as you mm -hmm. heard them say. Mm -hmm. um, voices that we heard there included SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt, um, the chief engineer for this mission, uh, Bill Gerstenmayer, um, and yeah, just around the horn for those comm checks uh, with the crew. On the left-hand side of your screen, just a quick check-in. Um, the team there is performing the recheck, or excuse me, yeah, the recheck for that side hatch closure. Um, so we did attempt to close the side hatch and um, perform a leak check, and we saw just a very slight loss of pressure during that leak check. So we opened it back up, wiped it down, 
teams didn't know anything major um, when they inspected it. So now we've reclosed it uh, and we are re-performing that leak check, which includes uh, basically pressure, put it, getting it up to pressurization or pressure uh, three minutes and then holding it at that pressure for five minutes. Um, so right now we're in that five minute wait period. So. Um, you know, as you can tell for the crew, it's a lot of waiting. It's, yep. <laughs> we do this and now we wait. Yep. And now we do this yep. and then we wait. Hurry up and wait, as they say. Yeah, and as and Kate, as you mentioned, um, and as uh, and as we heard, you know, on the concurrently while we're doing that um, that re that repress and recheck, you know, uh, we are also trying to concurrently perform those com checks, right, and and gain some time back as well. So crew, as they're in their vehicle waiting, um, you know, they're they're still they're still on track for their mission, right? They're still zeroed in on exactly what they've got to do, exactly how they can provide assistance and providing and following their procedures and working with the ground teams um, to stay on track. For, for sure, and it's worth noting, you know, we. We do build margin into um, the timeline for this exact reason. If you followed our uh, space flight, our human space flight missions before, sometimes you hear the core indicate that we have X amount of minutes of margin. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for this exact reason, um, you know, we we do build in that margin. And as I said uh, earlier, you know, the countdown itself is what aligns all the various teams working to support the launch on the same timeline. So it makes it's what makes sure that everybody syncs up. And so allowing us to, um, you know, perform those com checks while doing the repress and recheck, um, you know, just making sure that all those teams are continuing to, to remain aligned. Yeah. You know, I think during this, you know, waiting period too, crew sitting there thinking about not only what do I have to do today, you know, right now, like I'm waking up and I'm getting my suit checked out, there's steps all along the way and I can only imagine what they're, how they're thinking about what their mission is ahead of them, right? All of the work that we've heard that they're trying to accomplish on orbit, their objectives, you know, they're sitting there thinking, how can I be the most effective I can be over the next eight days, right? Um, and so I'm just thinking about the things that they're bringing up there with them, right? Little mementos that they're bringing up there with them. We heard some interesting things, um, you know, during their pre-briefing uh, last week. Uh, certain tokens and mementos of home that they're bringing up and what that means to them. It all plays a part of this mission, what kind of keeps them going through these waiting periods, you know, thinking about what am I going to do up there? What does this mean to me? What does this mean to the people back home? Um, and they're just ready to get up there and start working towards those objectives. So we're continuing to monitor the recheck of that side hatch closure. The team is performing that leak check now. Should be wrapping that up pretty soon. Once we get the leak check confirmed. Dragon SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. Good news, Arthur, thanks. All right, great news there. Fantastic. You might, might have heard some clapping here. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, for I should mention, um, you know, we're John and I here located at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Um, I actually hear some beeping yeah. now. We are a, a live operations environment <laughs> here in the rocket factory. Yep. Um, so the you know we're one hour and eighteen, uh, just over one hour and eighteen minutes. Um, until launch, and we're starting to see people gather, and yep. and uh, really, you know, the excitement is starting to build. And just hearing the confirmation that that leak check was good, yep. that side hatch is going to stay closed. Um, you know, the crew is. I think at that moment, you know, as I mentioned before, the seat rotation. That's an exciting moment because yeah. it's like, you know, it's like you're locked into the roller coaster, and, yep, and you know, you're here we go. go. And now hearing that that side hatch is good, it's closed, and it's going to remain closed um, until they splash back down. So when the crew ingresses and egresses from the space station, they will use the forward hatch. So that side hatch now will remain closed until they return to Earth after splashdown. Right, that's a huge step forward in today's launch. So, in addition to the scope of the science and research and outreach being performed on this mission, uh, AX-1 is also taking some time to better understand the role that food plays on orbit. A partner on this mission and a good friend of Axiom Space is Chef Jose Andreas and the team at Think Food Group. Known for his visionary culinary creations and humanitarian efforts, Chef Jose's World Central Kitchen is doing important work helping to feed those who are displaced. 
Chef Jose also prepared the meals and snacks accompanying our crew to the ISS. In space, astronauts have limited kitchen equipment and ingredients on hand, so having already prepared meals that are both appetizing and comforting is a great way to feel connected to home. Right, so joining us now is Chef Charisse Gray, who you saw in that video, Director for Research and Development at Think Food Group. Chef, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Chef, clearly Think Food Group is doing instrumental work in bringing people together with food uh, and has for a long time. What has been your team's mantra or ethos when it comes to creating these new dishes? Well, you know, I think Food Group, you know, our mission is to change the world through the power of food. And that's why we're so incredibly proud to partner with Axiom Space to have created the meals for the AX1 Mountain National Crew headed to the International Space Station. Um, as Chef Jose Andres often talks about building longer tables, this is such an extraordinary opportunity to do just that, um, bringing together the hardworking AX1 crew through food, um, reaching all the way to space. So as a partner on AX1, the culinary teams at Think Food Group have developed a meal to be shared amongst the crew in space on the space station. Uh, what did you put together? So the partner on the food uh, mission was born on a friendship between Chef Jose and fellow Spaniard and veteran astronaut Michael uh, Lopez Alegria, the commander of the upcoming mission. And as a result, we really wanted to lean on the flavors and traditional dishes of their native Spain. So we've made secreto de cerdo with pisto, which is a prized cut of Iberico pork with tomatoes, onions, eggplant, and peppers. And the second meal is chicken and mushroom paella. Uh, paella is, you know, Spain's quintessential rice dish, and the AX1 uh, crew will be able to enjoy also along with that some Spanish jamón, salchichón, and marcona almonds. Super cool. Uh, now, can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of those choices? You know, we wanted to be sure that we um, created meals that were not only nutrient rich, but satisfying and really delicious. Um, unlike, you know, traditional ready to eat meals that are designed for quick consumption. As chefs, we understand the importance of really, you know, bold and memorable flavors and created food that you'd really want to eat anywhere in the world or in this case, out of this world. Exactly right. So, so what were some of the challenges that you faced in trying to prepare those meals for out of this world? To make meals that are going to be traveling, you know, for over 250 miles away and, you know, putting in the forefront really crew member safety, uh, they had to be very carefully prepared. And so the AX1 crew meals were thermostabilized through the retort process. Now, your teams also put together a set of snacks that the crew is taking with them to enjoy uh, at various points on their journey to the ISS. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a few of those extra packets, and we'd love to share a snack together with you. Uh, what do we have here? So you're holding one of the pouches of the actual meals. Um, so uh, let me see what you've got there. It looks like you might have got the piece, though, or the rice. The I think rice. I have, have the, the rice. Valencia rice with chicken. Yes. yes. And I just spilled so, it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's a piece, though, there. Mm. Wow, just immediately the aroma yeah. just is strong. It's it's in a very good way. Yeah. It's, it's My mouth is already watering. Well, and that's John, what that, do you have? Yeah, so I've got I've got the pork stew, um, and I've got to say the same. The, the the aroma I think is really what is really what I would appreciate if I was on orbit and opening this up for the first time, right? We've heard uh, so much, especially on the crew system side at Axiom, you know how much aroma plays into, you know, just enjoying your meal, and that can go away uh, during your time on orbit. So I think it's a really important um, aspect to consider when you're preparing meals. Oh, but also, mm. snacks are super important. So, you know, along with those meals, the AX1 uh, astronauts will also be able to enjoy, like, some really Spanish uh, delicacies, such as jamón iberico de beota, um, jamón salchichón from Fermín, um, casas de Juelo olive oil, and marcona almonds by Albert Adria. This is way better than I would have anticipated. Yeah, yeah I've got to say, this is amazing, Chef Charisse. Yeah. Thank you very much for putting this together, and thank you for letting us enjoy it. Mm. 
You know, and um, you know, I was talking earlier about the the importance of that aroma plays, right, and being able to enjoy your meal. And we've often heard crew members reflect on how there's really just no better way uh, to see a world without borders up there than just simply looking out the window while in orbit uh, and enjoying some time together. So, you know, something as simple as sharing a meal, right, together, but while looking back at home can really be a pivotal step in coming to that realization together. So thank you very much for putting this together for our crew. Thank you for working with them. And thank you for joining us today and letting us enjoy this together. So we wish you and the Think Food Group uh, as much success as possible. And we look forward to hearing how it turns out on orbit. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be part of such a momentous. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, after you. <laughs> All right, I'm back. We're a uh, nice little quick break there. Just got uh, got our coffee loaded up here again. So we're ready to go. Let me fix my headphones here. There we go. Got to get them attached to the back, back of my shirt. Uh, yeah, now I'm hungry after watching them eat uh, the uh, the meals there. Uh, it's almost lunchtime, but uh, yeah. We're back here. Uh, so they did... Uh, Last I left you, we left you. We were uh, waiting on the second hatch closure. They did do the second hatch closure. Uh, they did a leak check on that, and all was good for the second hatch closure. So we're in good shape now, uh, ready to uh, continue on with the countdown process. So still a little over an hour to go. Coming up on the ISS position sync now. So they'll sync up the uh, the latest ISS position, which is now here. You see that green line getting a little closer. Uh, where is the ISS here? What? Where is it? There it is. Okay. Right here, uh, down by Australia here, actually. South, southern coast of Australia. Oh, we lost it. Hold on, let me get it back. There it is. Off the southern coast of Australia. Nighttime for the ISS right now. We'll be coming up and, uh... Heading right over uh, this direction here. So you can see how uh, that green line has uh, kind of gotten a little closer to Florida. Or actually, rather, Florida has gotten closer to the green line. Uh, so uh, it's starting. We've still got an hour to go. So those will uh, sync up and get uh, even a little bit closer still as we get closer to launch time. So the, that last position sync just kind of updates the onboard computers to uh, make sure that... Uh, we know uh, that the vehicle knows exactly where the ISS is, and that's what's happening here, uh, right? Or should be happening right about now. Uh, we got a weather briefing happening at at uh, T minus one hour, and uh, then we get the no go pol polling, and then uh, we're really going to be uh, getting into it here. So uh, then we kind of we're going to start flying through uh, some of the countdown here. Uh, to give you an idea on uh, trajectory here, in case you missed uh, the first part of the broadcast here, we're heading to uh, the northeast. Uh, obviously, that kind of matches up with our uh, the orbital path of the International Space Station. Right here, I'm going to put myself down here like this. So uh, our trajectory also going to be northeast. If you want to play around with the trajectory yourself, go check out flightclub.io. Declan the, is the magician behind fl flightclub.io, which is what this simulation is from. So go check out flightclub.io and uh, you can see the trajectory for yourself. Kind of play around, move it around here like I do. Um, you can see our, our launch happening here from 39A, launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. Here's 39B, which is where the SLS rocket, here's a live look at the SLS rocket, currently parked on top of 39B. That's not where, what we're launching today. That's that's still got some time. Uh, but, yeah, we get uh, first stage going to come up under powered flight. We get separation right here. Uh, that's going to come do a uh, landing entry burn and a landing burn down here in the ocean on the drone ship. Land on the drone ship. Second stage, continue on into orbit. Cut off right about here off the coast of North Carolina. And then it's in orbit, right? Doesn't take a long time to get to orbit, so... That's our trajectory. Docking will be tomorrow morning, 6.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. What's that? 10, 10.45 UTC tomorrow we'll be docking. Um, so uh, that uh, that's the plan for docking, assuming we get a, a nominal launch today. Otherwise, there are backup. Uh, there's a backup launch date for tomorrow and another backup after that on Sunday. So we got two backup opportunities 
Uh, main concern, our weather today looking very good. Only a 10% chance of violating launch constraints. Primary concern is the, those liftoff winds, right? So uh, that would be like your ground level winds, which are right now, they're, they're uh, forecasted to be about 20 miles per hour for the ground level winds, uh, which is about uh, 30 kilometers per hour. 16 knots somewhere in that range be the ground level winds gusting uh, to about 25 miles per hour gusting to 21 knots gusting to 40 kilometers per hour right in that range so it's kind of the upper end of uh the you know creeping up on the ground level winds that we'd like to see uh not super concerning but it is creeping up a little bit higher um upper level winds a little uh a little stiff today as well they're pretty strong uh they're 100 and what are we uh oh actually the the forecast oh no we're not at the upper level we're at the wrong level upper level winds forecast to be 143 miles per hour that's uh what does that come out to be 125 knots or uh 100 uh, 230 kilometers per hour is your upper level winds so upper level winds pretty strong but remember it's not just speed it's the gradient right for so uh, uh wind shear concern is rapid change in speed or direction. Um, so if it, and it really depends on that gradient, how quickly it changes getting up to that level. Uh, so those are the, uh, those are the main concerns for, uh, for launch today. But I think overall we're in, uh, we're in pretty good shape. I think well, one of the things, let me see, can I pull this up on the fly? I wanted to show talking about, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can pull this up. Uh, we wanna, I want to see if I can pull up an atmospheric sounding for you. For, let's see, what would be the closest station? Closest National Weather Service station, maybe like Jacksonville. And we want to get, I want to look at a, a skew T for Jacksonville. Here we go. Is this the latest one? No, hold on. Hold on, give me a second. We're gonna, I'm gonna pull this up here for you. We get the latest one, which would be... Oh, this is the latest one. Okay, so here is, for reference, a it's called a skew T graph, or skew T plot. This is from the latest sounding from the Jacksonville uh, National Weather Service here. So what you're looking at, uh, you know, some of the things that, that you can that you can pull from this is like your gradients, your wind change and your wind speed. So your wind is these barbs here on the right side, right? These are going up by altitude. These are all your wind barbs. So you can see the orientation of the barb here is showing wind direction. We don't have a major change in wind direction. Maybe down here at the surface level, you can see it a little bit, but it, it kind of goes away pretty quickly. Um, more concerning could be like your wind, the wind speed, right? It's relatively low, these first couple of barbs. Kind of hard to see what this the third barb is here, but it's relatively low speed. And then all of a sudden it jumps up to... Uh, what is that? I can't really, <laughs> hard to see what that is, but it looks like 80, 80 knots that it jumps up to pretty quickly. Is that right? Um, so it's looking, it it does kind of jump up pretty quickly, or is that, uh, I don't know, it's hard to see what this, what this barb is here. But you can see uh, kind of how, and and this is, this is the Jacksonville National Weather Service, they do the they do these every 12 hours, uh, these sounding balloons. But the uh, the 45th Space Wing does these every like 20 minutes or every 30 minutes leading up to a launch. So they're going to have their own data that's a little more accurate and a little more up to date than what we have what we have here. So this is uh, this is still a couple hours old. This is the 12Z balloon. Um, so this would have been like 8 a.m roughly 7, 8 a.m. this morning when these measurements were taken. So th this is still uh, two to three hours old for this, for these measurements here. 
So anyways, uh, just kind of giving you an idea of what the what the winds uh, might be looking like for that gradient for wind shear for upper le upper level wind shear. Let's see what John's saying here. At about T minus one hour. So they're on track right now to close out. We did have a good side leak, side hatch leak check. And so we're doing just the very last steps to uh, get the capsule ready for flight and then leave the pad. And of course, in the background, as you can see on the monitors or on your screens, it's blue skies over Kennedy Space Center, pad 39A. Weather's looking good, both in the local area, as well as when we head northeast towards the space station, the ascent trajectory looks good. So at T minus one hour and two minutes, all systems are go. Looking pretty nice. Look at those blue skies. That's that's fantastic. A lot of times in Florida, that you're you're worried about like thunderstorms popping up. Thunderstorms, big clouds, lightning rules. Uh, especially as we get closer and closer to the summertime, uh, that's a big concern. The big lightning strike right at uh, the SLS pad. Uh, a couple of uh, what was that like a week ago? Big lightning storm that struck the uh, lightning protection system. The big towers and cable system that's around the launch pad while while SLS was on the pad. But the lightning protection system protected it, so that was good news. So yeah, always gotta worry about that. That's why you've got all those lightning protection systems in place around, around the launch pad. All right, well, you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft that is in the final stages of preparation to launch the world's first all-private astronaut mission the International Space Station in just over one hour from now. Today's launch marks the next step in evolution of the human spaceflight story. This is the first of a number of planned private astronaut missions, or PAMs, by Axiom Space to the International Space Station, and it represents the culmination of years of hard work between both government and private entities to open up the doors to low Earth orbit. My name is John Rackham, and I am the Crew Systems Deputy Manager at Axiom Space, based Current out of Houston, Space Texas. Center. For awareness, we are cycling orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. All right, just some back and forth there between the crew uh, and the core. Uh, my name is Kate Tice. I'm the Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, with our coverage now expanding to NASA television, I'd like to welcome friend from NASA, Dan Hewitt, uh, coming to us from Johnson Space Center over at Houston, Texas. Hey, Dan. Hey, Kate, great to see you and the Johns. We're excited to join and get this milestone mission off the ground. <laughs> Liftoff time is still holding, uh, let's see, for 11.17 a.m. Eastern time uh, and currently tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. Uh, the range remains green, and as you can see there with that shot, the weather is definitely cooperating. Yeah, it's a beautiful day for launch. <laughs> what, what a gorgeous <laughs> shot. Now, over the last three hours, Axiom astronauts Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Mark Pathy, and Aton Stiba donned their SpaceX suits in our new suit up room uh, and were then transported to the pad where our crew entered the SpaceX Dragon, Dragon spacecraft that you see there live on your screen. Right, and since arriving at the spacecraft, our crews were helped by the closeout engineers or advanced team to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air and a communication link to Dragon Systems. And at that point, they conducted successful leak checks and communication checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person dedicated to speaking directly to the crew throughout the mission. The closeout team then sealed the hatch, uh, which also gets its own leak check. Um, unfortunately, that leak check didn't pass the first time, right. so we opened it back up, wiped it down, and performed that leak check again. Uh, and that second one was good, good so one. that leak check is closed. Or excuse me, that side hatch is now closed. Uh, moments from now, the closeout team will depart the pad uh, while weather operators kick off their final check on wind speeds at the pad uh, before the final go, no-go for launch. But before we get to that final go, no-go, uh, the SpaceX team will do an internal poll, making sure conditions are ready with Falcon 9, Dragon, the crew, the range, and the weather. Uh, let's pause now and watch, uh, with that, uh, watch the closeout crew as they uh, finalize their preparations there on the pad. So I, I wanna, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence over on Facebook, 
had uh, kind of an interesting interesting question that I thought maybe we'd uh, chat about a little bit. So he asked, uh, I wonder if the ISS can be used as a ferry uh, vehicle to the moon. So uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure what you mean by ferry vehicle, but I, I guess my interpretation of that was uh, using the ISS as not the ISS itself as a ferry vehicle, because um, the ISS doesn't really have a any pro, you know major propulsion itself to get itself from the moon and back. But uh, may, some people have pre, um, see, suggested the ISS as like kind of a pit stop on the way to the moon to use it as like a staging ground, which really probably doesn't help us a lot to stage at the ISS, right? It's a little bit easier to kind of just you know get to go directly to the moon than it is to go to the ISS, right? So the your biggest concern well, to get to the moon it actually is is not um I mean, although it's, you know, kind of weird to say it this way, but because we haven't been there in, you know, 50 years, but um to get to the moon is like from a rocket technology standpoint is rel relatively easy, right? Like we have rockets powerful enough that could get to the moon. Uh, so we don't really need a pit stop on the way there. Potentially, like if you look at Starship, Starship is looking at needing uh, refueling if it's going to take like ton, a lot of cargo to the, to the moon. So really what you would need, if you were going to have some sort of intermediate stop, which if, like if Starship goes to the moon, they're talking about doing this, is you need like a fueling depot where you could you could load up a ton of fuel, like bring up Starships with just fuel, load it up, you know, have it loaded up, and then you could launch astronauts and cargo up to the fueling depot, refuel, and then continue on to the moon. So we don't really need the ISS for that. I mean, the ISS more like a research station. Like the crew doesn't need. Go for launch. Sorry, they're talking here. That's in work, SpaceX. All right, so just some uh, back and forth with SpaceX core Arthur Burial and the crew um, continuing to work through our procedures. Um, ultimately, next check will be to make sure that the crew inside Dragon Endeavor are go for launch. Yeah. All right, so they're going to report go for launch here shortly. I'll try to listen in and turn it up in a second once I hear that. But, um, but yeah, so we don't really need to stop at the ISS to go to the moon or even to go to Mars for that matter. We may need an, a, an orbital stop to get there, but mostly it's going to be for refueling purposes. So really, you know, having a fueling depot in orbit of some sort is going to be... I think they said go for launch. Copy that endeavor. Crews go for launch. All right. Good All news. right. So that is yeah. fantastic news. Uh, that's basically four thumbs up inside yeah. uh, Crew Dragon right now. Um, yeah, so really good news there. Yeah. So All right, so we're getting a little bit closer. We should have the uh, the go no go polling coming up here soon. But anyways, yeah, so yeah, we would need a uh, a fueling depot to get uh, like the lunar starship to the moon uh, because it it has the cap. Well, one because it's fully reusable, uh, and two because uh, it, it can bring so much cargo. We uh, you're probably going to need to get it into into orbit refuel it and then take it there and not to mention that starship itself would actually be the landing vehicle right so starship has to be able to go to orbit go to the moon land on the moon get off the moon return back to earth and then land on earth so it's still it's got to do all of those things and you need fuel for all of those activities so that's the biggest the the biggest issue with uh with uh starship and why it's going to need refueling right if you remember uh like back in the apollo days right you'd launch this gigantic rocket most of it would be thrown away then you would launch to the moon and the the vehicle that got you to the moon would uh not be the vehicle that actually la landed on the moon right you had the lunar module that would land on the moon and then the entire lunar module didn't leave the moon right you just had the ascent stage that left the moon so we left part of it behind threw that away uh, then that would dock with the capsule again. Then you, then the, you'd leave the lunar module. That wouldn't come back to Earth along with the, the uh, upper the final stage there. 
that would also not come back. They would jettison all that and just the capsule would come back and it would land under parachute. So, so much of it, 90% of the Apollo launch vehicle was thrown away. And the only thing that came back after the mission was done was just a tiny capsule with some parachutes. So, uh, so yeah, we need, uh, we're going to need some additional fueling to get this giant starship into orbit, get the starship to the moon, get the starship down to the moon's surface, get it off the surface, return it to Earth, and get it to land on Earth so that we can reuse the whole thing again. So, uh, so yeah, that's... Uh, and then, uh, you know, going to Mars is even, even more so. Oh, here, speaking of the moon, look at this. Oh, they got some music playing. Greatness. Yeah, all right, well... I'm not going to be able to play it because they got their music playing, but we can watch because that's kind of cool. <laughs> some cool images of the uh, all the old programs, the Gemini program, the Apollo program, first spacewalks. These are cool. Earthrise. See, these are the thing like rendezvous with the lunar module. See, we really, we got to get back to the moon and do this kind of stuff again, right? This was a Skylab right here. Shuttle, we're, we're going through the whole thing. Everything, so. Yeah, we, we got to get, uh, we got to get us back to the moon, right? Hopefully soon. Can't wait till that happens. Uh, I truly, Jeremy says, I truly believe that the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia will be, will join the AX-1 crew in spirit. All right. Yeah. If watching over uh, the AX-1 crew. I still, Sarah says, I still think it's crazy that we went, we went to the moon when not that much earlier, we just mastered powered flight, right? It was pretty amazing how fast things advanced and then things kind of. Got a little bit slow. Not that we haven't advanced. We advanced in other areas, you know, computers and technology and software and engineering. So, I mean, I, you know, I think there were advancements along the way. We just didn't see a lot of those directly in uh, in space flight for a long time. You know, space space shuttle was a a whole different engineering advancement. Uh, I don't know. I think I've said before, space shuttle is not my favorite uh, space vehicle. Definitely a unique vehicle. It was really, you know, it was really cool looking. But from an engineering standpoint, it was not. You know, it just seemed like there were a lot of a lot of uh, gaps in the engineering process for space shuttle. Right, the whole like not having an abort, anything, any any abort scenario before until after two minutes of launch right there was no pad abort scenario while the solid rocket boosters were on uh there was no abort scenario so you had to wait until the solid rocket boosters were off before you could do any sort of abort um which obviously we saw during uh during the challenger uh event so uh so yeah it didn't and then of course the cost of it being crazy expensive to try to reuse it i think it was a, it was great in theory with the, this idea that we were going to reuse a launch vehicle it just never never worked out where it was inexpensive enough to kind of just to be launched over and over and over again right it was pretty it was pretty cool looking it just had it seemed to ha have a lot of flaws in the the i don't know i don't want to say like system flaws itself just conceptual flaws i guess is what the things that i didn't like about it right the no abort scenario um or some of the other uh you know the cost obviously all the, the issue with tiles and things like that time waster set the space shuttle was awesome elon would have made it cost effective yeah if it could have been cost effective like i do think even though the space shuttle wasn't my favorite launch vehicle I do think it would have been cool to see it keep launching. Like, I think there could have been a place for it. Like, oh, jeez, I'm kicking things again. I really got to move this stuff under my... Those are my rudder pedals for my flight simulator that are underneath, that are by my feet here, that I keep kicking. Um, I do think it would be cool if we could... 
right? Like if uh, if we had a capsule system to launch astronauts to orbit, like to the space station for something simple, but having the cargo carrying capability of the space shuttle was pretty cool. Like the like that was kind of cool. So. Um, yeah, it was just, but conceptually, like, the, like, the space shuttle was originally envisioned to carry astronauts, but then, like, the, the military was like, well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do all this, like, we want to make sure that you can carry cargo, because we want to put spy satellites in here and launch those to orbit, so they were, uh, you know, they were, I think they were trying to do too much in a single vehicle, right? They, we should have had, we should have kept going with a capsule system, where we could keep sending people to the moon or start working on sending people to Mars and maybe have a shuttle, you know, a shuttle or satellite launching system, you know, maybe some sort of combo system that could do astronauts and payloads at the same time. Like if you were going to do uh, a Hubble space telescope repair mission, right? That was kind of important to be able to to uh, latch on to Hubble and have astronauts along with along the ride too. So, yeah, anyways, interesting. I, I don't know. I just get I'm more frustrated with the space shuttle because of, uh, because it was so expensive. I'm, I'm more frustrated that it got shut down and was so expensive and it couldn't keep going because it was a cool, a cool concept. But I feel like something could have been different there. I, I'm disappointed that, like, we stopped going to the moon. Like, when we got shuttle, we stopped doing lunar missions. We, we had no, we didn't even have a system to go to the moon anymore. It was just gone. So, anyways, there you go. There's my rant about space shuttle. Brief the CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. All right, now we're getting into it. issues affecting the safety of the operation. Operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. For those operators in firing up four, in the event of a fire alarm, key operators noted in 57.83 will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Firing group four and MCCX will go into a sterile cockpit and lock down for the duration of the time the launch escape system is armed. Launch shuttle at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Over that, arming crew arm for, crew arm for movement. T minus 45 minutes and counting. You've just heard the SpaceX launch director give the Final execution instructions to the launch Crew team. Access arm retraction started. We're ready for propellant load. That'll begin in about 10 minutes. Before that, we've got crew access arm to retract happening now, and then arming of the launch escape system. Everything continues to look good for an on-time launch of Falcon 9 with Axiom-1 mission. All right, here we go. Crew access arm coming back. I do want to, I saw a comment. Dragon SpaceX oh. for tablets. As we prepare to step into LES arming, uh, I need you to verify that the elastic bands are over the corners of all of the iPads in the vehicle. I just stand by. Make sure their iPads are secured. I haven't heard them say that before. I wonder if it was an issue before on a launch. SpaceX Endeavor, Arthur, I can confirm that the elastic bands on the platforms are around the All right, copy that. Thank you, MLA. And for awareness, that last call came in pretty quiet. So if you could speak up on the upcoming calls, that'd be great. Thanks. Well, sir, Okay, so what I was going to say, um, what, this is kind of a separate topic. We talked about Starship and Lunar Starship. I think it's important to, uh, we should make a distinction between Lunar Starship, the NASA Lunar Starship, and kind of the Starship system in general, right? So NASA, NASA has a, a Lunar Starship program, which they're going to use in, conjunct in conjunction with 
the Orion capsule, right? So the Orion capsule is actually going to ferry... Uh, that, this is where Starship is just a lunar lander. So NASA is going to ferry astronauts to Starship, and then Starship will go from lunar orbit down to the surface, back to lunar orbit, and Orion will ferry the, the astronauts back. But Starship itself is designed to be a system that could launch and land in lunar orbit, right? They're, de they're trying to design Starship to, so that SpaceX could theoretically do their own private missions to land on the moon, right? And they wouldn't use the Orion capsule to do any of that kind of stuff, right? So you've got like the, uh, the Dear Moon mission, that's not gonna land on the moon, but that's gonna launch, go, you know, do a lap around the moon and come back. Um, so there are, there's kind of, there's a couple, that's one of the nice things about the Starship platform that I like is that the diversity of it, there's kind of a couple different programs planned for that. So we have like the Lunar Starship that is going to go land on the moon for NASA as just as a NASA lunar lander. That's going to be its only purpose. But uh, SpaceX is going to be able to, they're planning to be able to launch astronauts as well, like the Dear Moon mission that's a lap around the moon, or launch astronauts to the moon and even land them on the moon. So so we've got, uh, ju we, we do have the NASA plan, which is using the Orion capsule, but it's, I think it's important to note that that's not, that's not the only way that SpaceX is going to plan to get astronauts out to the moon or to Mars. Go ahead, Arthur. All right, MLA, at this time I can give you a go to step through section seven of four decimal 100, close visors and arm the launch escape system. Here we go. Arming the escape system. This is where we're getting work. So now they're getting their visors closed. Six X and Denver, visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. We're getting that escape system armed. Now at this point, they gotta have their visors closed because at any point, once that's armed, if some sort of anomaly happens, they're gonna they're going for a ride. They gotta be they gotta be ready to to ride the dragon at this point. Hopefully hopefully they don't go for a ride for another 40 minutes. But in theory, they gotta be ready to uh ride at any point for the next 40 minutes. Uh what happened to Starliner? Is it cancelled no Starliner is not cancelled. I don't think they will cancel it. Uh they I mean the U.S. from a government standpoint needs redundancy, especially now with everything everything going on with Russia. Like we can't, the U.S. is not is uh, going to be hard pressed to rely on Russia or you know at really any outside country, but um, you know particularly with everything going on with Russia. Dragon SpaceX uh, launch escape system is verified armed. The U.S. needs to make sure they have redundancy. To get to space. All right, there you heard it. The launch escape system is now armed. You can see there the crew in their seats with the visors down. Uh, launch escape system, um, you know, is the first of its kind escape system. Um, it provides escape capability all the way to orbit. It's a really uh, important function to have. Um, obviously, no intention of using it today, um, but that's what those callouts were there um, back and forth that we just heard. Right, and as we heard earlier too from Administrator Bill Nelson, um, you know, the importance of low Earth orbit. So speaking of just how valuable low Earth orbit is, the crew of X-1 will be conducting a tremendous amount of science over the course of their eight days on board the ISS. And not only does that include 25 Axiom managed studies, but it also includes the Axiom crew participating in efforts that extend far beyond this mission. Some of those we actually looked at earlier. One of these broader studies is a series of health monitoring tests before and after the flight. A few days ago, I was able to connect with Dr. Emmanuel Riquetta to talk about the ongoing research this crew will participate in on behalf of the Translation Research Institute for Space Health, also known as Trish. Here's our conversation. All right, so while they're talking about this, uh, the conversation here, uh, let's see, I'm gonna switch over to uh, this view. 
So we can see our astronauts, a little bit grainy, but that's okay. Um, and actually it would be nice if I could do, uh, let's see. Hold on. We're gonna do, uh, let me see if I can, we're gonna do more producing on the fly. Uh, maybe if I can put this, I want to, I want to get rid of this box around me, but I don't remember how to do that. No, oh, yeah, forget it. Um, what was I, what were we talking about a second ago? Oh, so I did see a couple comments. What if they have to use the restroom? So the actual the actual Crew Dragon toilet, they can't activate till they're in orbit. Uh, there's speculation about whether or not they they wear uh, mags, the maximum absorbency garments, adult diapers. Um, I I have not heard one way or another whether they do or not, but I believe that they do. Um, and really, the reason I believe that is because uh, well, why not? Right? Like what what's what is the reason against wearing them? They did, all the astronauts used the bathroom right around T minus three hours. Um, so not that long ago, but still the question is like, why not? Why, what, if somebody give me a reason why it would be a bad idea to wear mags during launch. I, I don't have one. So because of that, like, will are they gonna need it? Probably not, but I still don't see a reason why not to wear them. So anyways, so I think they do wear mags, adult diapers. I, I see no reason not to, right? Last thing you want to do is be 20 minutes prior to launch or right now, 35 minutes prior to launch and be like, Hey, uh, uh, listen, uh, we got to cancel. Like, I really got to go. <laughs> like we, you don't want that. Or you get to launch and you're like, well, uh, what you know, my uh, my spacesuits, little uh, is a little used now. So what do I do? <laughs> Be like, well, too bad. So, anyways, uh, somebody talked about itching. Uh, what if they have to itch their nose? Um, I don't know if these have them, but we, I know that on the NASA, uh, the EMUs, the the their spacewalking suits, they have a, a chin pad, right, that they can kind of go like this with there's like a, a pad on their chin they can just tip their head down and go like that to itch their nose or itch their face i mean it's not easy but they they do have the ability to kind of itch their nose on that pad i assume they could do the same thing with the the spacex suits uh but obviously i don't know that for sure um and then the rest of the suits you know, they're just going to kind of have to wiggle or, you know, shake or try to itch them it's through the suit. If they're, you know, their arm itches or something, they're, you know, they're kind of, that's the only way they can do it. Uh, do they go up for a long drive or just up and down? So this mission is going to the International, they're going up, they're going to meet with the International Space Station. They're going to stay there for eight days and then, uh, and then they're going to come back. So it's a, an eight day mission and then they're back. So a little different than uh, a little different than Inspiration Four, which didn't go to the space station. They just kind of went to space and then came back. But uh, they're they're actually going. They have a destination this time. Hey, Katie B, one of our one of our regulars. Katie B sent over a super chat. Thank you, Katie. He said howdy, howdy from Illinois, Tori. Glad to be with you and the crew for the first crewed launch since I moved. One year down, here's to many more launches. I didn't, well, I guess I didn't know that, that you moved, or maybe that was off my off my radar, but uh, congrats on the move. And uh, thanks for the super chat. Thanks, Katie. Uh, let's see, why eight days? Uh, I don't know why they picked eight days. I mean, I think that was kind of, I mean, I don't think NASA wants people, at, you know, uh, visitors at the space station for too crazy long. Um, so I think that was probably the longest that uh, NASA was like, yeah, we'll let you stay for eight days. Uh, but I don't know if anybody knows the the reason why they chose eight days. Let me know. But uh, I suspect that it was it was really just a uh, 
you know kind of a timing thing we you know we also have the crew uh crew four going up on uh on april 20th right so that's only uh 12 days away so they kind of have to get out of the way so that the next the next crew four mission can go up to the space station so we got a, we got a lot a uh, lot of travelers going back and forth from the uh from the space station these days. Great demo of the helmet. <laughs> helmet itching move. Yeah, well, that's it did my best. <laughs> uh, let's see. That's just wasting money and and fuel the eight day. Well, remember, I mean, once the fuel is only used during launch, right? So I mean, you have a little bit, a tiny bit of thruster fuel that's used to maneuver, but the bulk of the fuel, I mean, first of all, the, the fuel is a very small portion of the actual cost, right? So Elon has said in the past that uh, they only use about half a million dollars worth of, of fuel, which is still, I mean, it's a lot of money for fuel, but um, we don't know what they're charging private astronauts, but they're charging NASA, you know, something like, 90 million dollars a seat or so, or 60 million dollars a seat I forget what the actual number is but um you know whatever it is it's a lot of millions of dollars uh for the actual for the actual ride itself right for the vehicle for the capsule for the engines for all that kind of stuff so that like the vehicle itself the development the hardware the personnel all that kind of stuff is wait like that is the expensive part the fuel relatively is a pretty small portion of the of the cost um but even still but even if the fuel was like ridiculous <clears throat> well and who knows what the fuel cost is today but uh even though even if the fuel cost was say you know 90 percent of the vehicle cost which it's not but say it was you're you're using it one way or another it doesn't really matter how long your stay is at the international space station so this is in response to uh who was it? i don't remember who who said that um maddie the fuel we use monomethyl hydrazine um so the sorry i heard something on the, their comm radios there but uh yeah so the, the bulk of the fuel is used during launch so they're i mean going to space they're using the, the fuel it doesn't really matter how long their stay at the international space station is they don't have they're not using fuel to stay to stay in orbit right once they're in orbit it's relatively stable I mean, over the co course of like long periods of time, like the International Space Station does have to get boosted every every once in a while um, as the orbit decays. But over a period of eight days, um, not uh, not a factor. Like they're not using fuel to stay to stay in orbit. Once they're in orbit, they're there. Launch escape system is RCS thrusters for maneuvering. Right? Yeah. So there are there are thrusters for maneuvering. Uh, so they do have to use. I mean, they do use a little bit, but comparatively speaking, like the bulk of the fuel is during launch. Should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad, we have the ability to use a launch escape system right now if it was needed. A couple other status items. Weather, as you can see, looks good. Probability of violating the launch commit criteria is less than 10%. The only thing we're watching is wind gusts, but we believe, having seen the, the wind for the last several hours, everything continues to look good. That should not be an issue. Weather is also good in the Atlantic Ocean should we need to use a launch escape splashdown site for the Dragon capsule. We've also got upper altitude winds we've been checking out. Uh, balloons have been released by the range here recently. We continue to look good for upper altitudes as Falcon 9 th flies through the periods of ma maximum dynamic pressure. And finally, on the range, of course, we have cleared the danger areas, the hazard, the caution areas. Everybody's out of there except the four-person crew up in the Dragon capsule, very top of the rocket you can see in the picture. So coming up, T-minus 28 the, minutes, 30 seconds. And the drone that's flying around there that we just saw a second ago. <laughs> I think that was the drone flying the around. One mission. Not sure if you guys saw that. Let's take a moment now to get acquainted with the vehicles that you see there on your screen. That's a live view of Falcon 9 with Dragon, uh, our spacecraft on top. Falcon 9 rocket is a rocket um, 
to me. Falcon 9 rocket with a Dragon spacecraft on top uh, together stands about 215 feet, which is almost 30 feet taller than the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy, oh, <laughs> which is 130, uh, 183 feet. Um, Falcon 9 is a reusable two-stage liquid-fueled rocket, uh, which means that it's kind of like two rockets in one, the first stage and the second stage. Very cool. So I'm talking a bit about that first stage. The first stage is the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle that you see there. It has that nice patina. It's been reused a, a little bit. Um, it's covered in soot from a previous mission. That first stage is responsible for accelerating Falcon and Dragon through the Earth's atmosphere and into space. To do that, it has nine Merlin engines at the bottom of that first stage. Prior to liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage is loaded up with nearly 1 million pounds of fuel and liquid oxygen. And the Merlin engines on the first stage are optimized for sea level. Uh, these achieve 190,000 pounds of thrust during ascent and descent. The first stage accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere into space and then separates the rest of the rocket at about two and a half minutes into flight. From there, the first stage will do what no other oh, orbital class ship. rocket in the world can do. It'll make its way back to Earth and target a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, which you see there on your screen. The, uh, the seas look great, the blue skies. I, I don't think it could be any more picture perfect. No, it's like a desktop <laughs> right there, I think. Uh, our drone ships are essentially autonomous, powered spaceports that allow our rocket to land over the ocean. Uh, for reference, our drone ships are equivalent to the size of a football field. So uh, while it may have looked kind of small on your screen, they're actually pretty ginormous in real life. <laughs> it's got to be to hold a rocket, right? It was kind of rocking and rolling there a little bit, though. Like, uh, even though, I mean, it did look pretty clear out there, it was kind of rolling in the seas a little bit, which is always just amazing to me that they can land a skyscraper on this thing. And even if it's rocking and roll in a little bit it it still stays it's crazy now the second stage is essentially a smaller version of the first stage and whereas the first stage is designed to power the vehicle out of earth's atmosphere in the forces of gravity the second stage is specifically designed to operate in the vacuum of space the second stage powers the dragon spacecraft to its specific oh that's specific a good that's a good point there uh, Odie said look at the lateral speed of that uh that contrail there that's true like if you see that that's moving pretty quick. Remember our upper level winds, which is probably wherever that plane was flying, is probably in that in that area. Uh, that those upper level winds are 140, 150 miles an hour, 100 approaching 160 even. Uh, so it's moving quick in those upper level winds. You could cut. It was a pretty good view of that with that contrail just kind of drifting in the wind there, drifting to the east. Flight to space uh, for this Dragon spacecraft uh, that the Axiom One crew is flying in today. Uh, the previous flights for this th this capsule supported were uh, recently the Crew-2 mission and before that the Demo-2 mission, uh, which was our first human space flight mission. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Now, as we await T-0 in just under 25 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of this mission will look like. Right, so once we hit T minus zero, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. The first of which is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which, as the name suggests... Okay, you can see... Uh, sorry, I'm going to turn them down for a second, but you can, you can see exactly where the fuel level is uh, in the, or the, really it's probably the liquid oxygen level that you can see exactly where it is in the booster uh, because you can see that condensation coming off and you can see where the discoloration is exactly. So we can kind of see the fill level like watching it right here. You can see the condensation starting to form. Remember that that liquid oxygen being put into the rocket is negative 340 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, super, super cold, uh, but yeah, that's uh, it's pretty cool when you can kind of see the exact level where it's where it's been filled to. 
Merlin engine and that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn, which is a single engine burn, will bring the vehicle's speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship uh, at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. And once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. And lastly, the nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and finish around T plus 15 minutes. Uh, and this sequence will expose Dragon's docking mechanism in advance of its arrival at the International Space Station. So, uh, as you can tell, it's, it's a pretty jam-packed 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay close attention to what you're listening to. Don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with all of that in mind, um... all right. So a couple. So now that they've kind of gone through that and they've moved off of here, so just want to wanted to throw up a couple of things. Uh, uh, Sarah talked about uh, the G's that they experience. Not a ton of G forces, right? It's not like they're a crazy huge fighter pilot. Um, if we actually, so here's our trajectory. Somebody asked about the trajectory as well. Going to the northeast, launching from Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Space Center to the northeast to catch up with the International Space Station, which is currently look at how look how close our green line has come. Here's the International Space Station, way up here, right? It's gonna we're gonna have to catch up to it. Uh, but you can see that the orbital path here is getting uh, much closer. So important to really get aligned with that orbital path. Really, the path isn't moving. It's the Earth that's rotating underneath the path. So Earth is getting closer to the path. Um, so, uh, but G-forces, if we go, uh, we could probably look at, uh, can I do it on the fly? Here you go. G-forces here from Declan over at Flight Club. You can see during the launch, during the first stage of launch, we only hit about uh, maybe three and a half Gs, right? Then the second stage of launch goes up a little bit higher and we get up to uh, just under four Gs. So not a crazy amount of G-force that the astronauts are experiencing. Only about, uh, you know, between three to three and a half to four Gs is really the most that they experience. And, and the majority of that, the strongest uh, G-force that they're going to see is right before the second stage, uh, right before Seco, second stage cutoff. Uh, so, Houston, 445. Uh, so, yeah, not to, like fighter jet pilots, which are, you know, in a turn pull, you know, seven, eight, nine Gs, something like that, something crazy. Um, it's not like the astronauts have to endure uh, eight Gs for, you know, 15 minutes. It's not really that that's super uh, uncomfortable station hatches we expect it to be a little under two hours from docking to hatch open and then we'll welcome the ax1 crew on board this uh let's see did i miss anything else 20 and a half hour journey but all that's gonna start with a launch how long does it take to reach the iss um yeah so it can it kind of varies based on uh you know the day that they're launching um it's not, I don't know, a lot of people get hung up on why it take. why does it take SpaceX so long to get there? Uh, I mean, I did cover a video on this. SpaceX could get there faster. It just depends on when all the parameters kind of line up. Here you can see the booster color changing now. You can see it's, it's even more full than it was just a few minutes ago. You can see exactly where that fill line is. Um, SpaceX could get there faster if the orbital parameters all lined up, right? If the space station was in a perfect alignment at the perfect time and we're launching on the perfect day and blah, like it could get there faster. The question is like, do you want to wait for all that to be perfect? Or like, like, there's not really any reason. Like you can launch astronauts. They can hang out for 16, 17, 19, 24 hours, whatever it happens to be in the Crew Dragon, right? We had Inspiration4 that spent, what, three days or something like that. Um, so plenty of time they can spend time in the crew dragon it's not super uncomfortable um so it's really yeah it takes them about uh what's it going to be this time i think it's you know somewhere around 19 20 hours they're they're docking at 6 45 a.m eastern time tomorrow 
which is, uh, what's that, 1045 UTC. Um, so launching at 1117 today, about uh, 17 minutes from now. So Russians are saying they can get there in two hours. How true is that? Yeah, so, I mean, the Russians have, they have gotten there faster. Uh, and they, like, they, I think they have the record for the fastest time with, uh, getting there. But, uh, you know, again, that has to be a perfect alignment uh, of the space station. Uh, you know, sometimes they can, they have even moved the space station to be more perfectly aligned so that they could get there in uh, just a few hours. I don't know about two hours. Two hours sounds pretty short. I think, what's the shortest? The shortest was around like six hours, wasn't it? Or four, something like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they could definitely, they have definitely gotten there faster and SpaceX could get there faster as well. But here, look, you can see another, is that, is this a, is this the same shot we saw before? Or is this another contrail? Moving. That was weird. It's almost like the exact same shot we saw before with the contrail drifting directly over the, the crew dragon. So we're coming up on it now, 16 minutes. Uh, the last thing we passed, the weather gate. Uh, that's the 30 minute weather gate. Not really a concern for today. That weather gate would be for like uh, any of the 30 minute rules. Like you can't have a lightning strike within 30 minutes. There we go. Lock, stage All right, two locks so good load. news there. We have begun locks load, uh, liquid oxygen loading on second stage. Uh, so that is currently underway for first and second stage, as well as loading of RP-1, uh, which is our fuel on both first and second stages. Right. Right, and again, you know, some of those things that he talked about, it's all following a timeline, right? And we are listening to, for those important cues along the way that we're hearing on these nets or on the loops, um, uh, listening for where are we along in that timeline so we know exactly where we are in terms for launch as we count down at just T minus 15 from launch. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking uh, at my dashboard here. It looks like fuel load on second stage is now complete. Uh, so we're re beginning that locks load as we just heard. Um, locks load and fuel load continues on uh, first stage. So uh, uh, let's see, Wild West Dan had a nice comment about the TFR. He said, you'd think there'd be a TFR in place as soon as they, the TFR actually is in place. Here's a, this is a view from my pilot app that I use with flying. Here's, this is the TFR right here that's in place, but the backside of the TFR is actually relatively close, um, right? Cause they're going out this direction. Uh, so planes can fly right, right down this area here. I don't know if I can put, can I turn on traffic? Yeah, here we go, turn on traffic. Um, and you can actually see, so here's live traffic that's out here. You can see everybody following this air route here. There's a whole bunch of planes coming by this direction. Here's Southwest Southwest plane, uh, Southwest Airlines. There's some smaller ones out here as well. Uh, somebody is in the TFR, but that's probably a NASA something or another. Um, but but yeah, there is a TFR there, but the backside of the TFR is, is pretty close. Um, so that's probably where those contrails are coming from. Yeah, TFR, sorry, <laughs> Wild West Dan. The TFR is a temporary flight restriction, so that's where airplanes are not allowed to fly. So this is from my pilot app. Uh, this is, it's called Four Flight. Um, so this is, this is the TFR. You click on it, it says uh, TFR was in place uh, starting at 8.12, 8.12 a.m. Uh, there was another TFR uh, that's currently inactive. It started at 7.49, but yeah, the, T the active TFR right now went into effect at 8.12 a.m. Eastern time. So it has been in effect for a little while. Began propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. We just heard loading of the RP1 fuel. The kerosene fuel on stage two was completed right on time at T minus 20 minutes. We've still got fuel going on to the first stage. Looks like we're about 90% or so full right now. Fuel loading will finish up at T minus six minutes, and we'll hear that call out in the countdown. Meanwhile, densified liquid oxygen is continuing to load onto both the first and second stages. First stage will close out at T minus three minutes. The second stage, we just began loading liquid oxygen at T minus 16 and a half minutes just a few minutes ago. 
That'll wrap up at the T-minus two minute mark. Now we load the liquid oxygen as late as we can in the countdown. It's densified, that means it's ultra cold, well below the boiling point of liquid oxygen. That lets us put as much as we can on the vehicle for performance and getting it on board the vehicle just before liftoff means it won't warm up where you start to lose uh, the ability to put liquid oxygen onto the stages, into the tank uh, in the quantities we want. So it stays nice and cold, it doesn't bleed off, and that gives us the performance we need on Falcon 9. Continuing on, Falcon 9 checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles, you may hear that term, they're coming up. Oh, look We're at also this going angle. to be doing throttle valve checkouts cool. on the Merlin engines. That helps control the power of the engines as we go through flight. For example, you hear a throttle down and a throttle up as we prepare for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. I don't recall seeing this camera angle before. 12 minute mark. The range continues to be go. Uh, roadblocks are up, all the hazard areas are clear. Airspace, sea space is good. The weather is go. Beautiful shots you can see here, blue skies. I'm looking forward to some great views from the cameras as we head into space. And then finally on the Dragon side, the Dragon mission director and team, they're reporting no issues. We've done the communication checkouts Use. with the crew. You can see the crew axis arm has retracted into the launch position. You can see Dragon now with the strong back of the transport director and the umbilicals going to Dragon alongside of it. We've also armed the launch escape system and obviously the crew is strapped in the Dragon capsule and they're ready to go. Final instructions of the crew will come in about a minute and a half at T minus 10, we'll listen to that. The crew displays will be configured for launch and that setup will give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and it provides constant updates on vehicle health. The T minus five minutes will be in the terminal count for Dragon. Dragon will transition to internal power going to its onboard batteries and off of the external ground power. We're going to hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we go from T minus 10 to 0, and then as we fly after T0 and liftoff, we'll hear callouts as we head into space. And that'll be letting the crew know as they reach each of the milestones. Our next big event coming up at T minus 10 minutes is we're going to do launch commit criteria and final instructions will be going to the crew. One other thing that you will hear is during ascent you may hear one alpha, one bravo, two alpha. These are launch escape states. As the Falcon 9 flies, if a launch escape was required, the crew on board knows where they are passing various points in the countdown, and that would tell Dragon what sequence of events to execute to come off of the Falcon 9 and bring the crew back safely down under the parachutes in the ocean. Right now, T minus 10 minutes, let's listen in to the countdown now. Dragon, SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX and Never, we confirm they're configured. Copy MLA, and on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Endeavour for its third flight to the International Space Station. Axiom 1 marks a new step in commercial space flight and research. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. All right. Um, Thanks for those words, Arthur. I've got a few of my own. I'm going to let my crewmate Aton say it first, though. Shalom. כמה ימים לפני שאנחנו מציינים את המסע הגדול שלנו לחירות and a few minutes before launching on this journey I wish to share with you the words of the Greek poet Constantine Kavafi that well described the perspective of, of our marvelous crew Keep Ithaca always in your mind Arriving there is what you are destined for but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. To you, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you this marvelous journey. X1, Rakia. Thank you, Eitan. I'm going to continue far less elegantly or eloquently, but uh, as we sit here on the precipice of this new era in human spaceflight, we do so on the shoulders of professionals at 
SpaceX, NASA, and Axiom. We um, want to thank all the teams at SpaceX, uh, Falcon 9, Dragon, the launch team, of course, closeout team, uh, all of the folks in mission control, um, and of course, our training teams. With NASA, boy, it's been tough. You know, the first time is always hard, and there's no playbook. It's all open field running, but with ISS program, commercial video development, and flight operations, we've learned a lot, and we'll continue to do so. We want to thank Cam and Seth for their vision, but especially all the people at Axiom for putting this mission together with the minor miracles that they performed. All of you, make no mistake, are the men and the women in the arena. Their faces are marred, if metaphorically, by the dust, sweat, and blood, and you strive valiantly. You will have no place with the cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. The crew of the great ship Endeavor is ready to sail her proudly, Arthur. That's probably the most that any crew has said before launch. That was quite a bit. Some heartfelt words there. Stage one, engine chill has started. All right, so there was the call that uh, we have begun to chill the engines on uh, the first stage. Here so we what we're doing Six right now, now is flowing a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen uh, through the turbo pumps on those M1D engines. There's nine of them at the base of the first stage. Uh, and that's essentially bringing them down to the temperature of that super chilled liquid oxygen to uh, prevent any thermal shock to the hardware. Uh, and just before that, call some really heartfelt words from yeah. Commander MLA uh, and Mission Specialist Aton Stibba. Um, really love hearing that commentary. Stage one, RP load is complete. All right, while we're getting ready here, I think Wild West Dan reminded me to to tell y'all, especially if you're whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you know, you know maybe consider giving it a little thumbs up. It helps. At this it all point helps. In time, the you know the uh, all the the algorithms and all that kind of stuff. So if you're watching, you're having a good time, you like that that uh, we do these kind of things. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up because that's the only way that I know you guys like this kind of stuff. Plus, it helps other people find us, right? Because unless you're sharing it, then other people can't find us. They don't know we're here. Coming so. up on five and a half minutes. Anyways, there's my spiel. Kate's let us know that we've got the field load complete. Next is coming up with T minus five minutes. Dragon will be transitioning uh, configuration for terminal count and going on its internal battery power. Everything continues to look good as we're counting down. All right, five minutes to go. Yeah, Odie says 900, 922. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. There you go. Falcon 9 tanks are pressing for strong back retract. 922 people currently watching, and only 390 of you have given it a thumbs up. Oh, man. Come Heard the call out. We're pressurizing the tanks for strong back retract. We'll hear a sequence momentarily. Strongback is retracting. Actually, that's the start of about a one minute sequence. In about T minus four minutes, the clamp arms that you can see there will open. And then, the, is and then we will see the retract from there. Christo Taku. We've heard the call out. That's the start of the sequence. Doesn't mean that the clamp Thanks. arms uh, are late opening. We'll Christo, take us a few more seconds. Christo Taku, thanks for the super chat. Really appreciate that. It says cheers. Cheers to you. Cheers As to everybody. You can hear the excitement yeah. and the crowd is really growing oh, yeah. uh, here at SpaceX headquarters <laughs> at Hawthorne, California. Four minutes now. There you can see the clamp arms have begun to open. Let's get. And next we should see the strong back uh, begin to retract. Did we pull the Space Lobster Nation yet? I don't think we have. Space Lobster Nation, this is uh, Space Lobster Control. Go no, give me a go-no-go no go in chat for launch. The structure is what we basically use to transport uh, the fully integrated vehicle to and from the hangar, uh, from the hangar to the launch pad. And there you can see that strong back retraction has begun. There we go. There's it. We're getting the go-no-go no go poll in chat. Boost. Facebook, Everything continue go. to look Phenomenal, YouTube. Uh, as we're now under three Go. and a half minutes until launch. 
RP-1 fuel is fully loaded on first and second stage. Uh, should be wrapping up LOX load on uh, the first stage momentarily and continuing to fill on second stage. Yeah, now we're getting the chat rolling. Stage look at one, the LOX load is complete. Look at the goes. Just, just spam the chat. I want to see these goes. Spam, this is your time to spam away. My moderators are gonna go, they're gonna hate me for this, but We're do it, spam the chat. Until Give me a go, of the spam Axiom like crazy. Mission. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard that Dragon is on internal power. Um, as I was saying, we're getting close. The crowds are growing. The excitement is palpable. Yes, everybody's going. see there on the left-hand side of your screen, Mich Mission Control here in Hawthorne, California, just behind where John and I are. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that looks like Axiom Mission that Control. That looks like Axiom Mission Control in Houston, Texas. Axiom Everybody's Mission waving Control. Everybody's waving and saying, hey. I love it. I love when the chat starts spamming go and it just rolls past so fast that I can't even read it. It's All awesome. Right, at this point you guys are, time, you guys are fantastic. First stage <laughs> is complete. So the first stage is now fully loaded with all of its propellant. Box load on second stage continues. Here we go. At about a minute and a half, we'll have the final big vent of liquid oxygen. You'll see a big, huge vent of As liquid oxygen. Before, that's HQ, lock load is complete. It's normal. They're draining the lines. Right, so there's that call. At this point in time, Falcon 9 is... Dragon is in auto idle. Dragon is fully loaded with all of its propellants, nearly 1 million pounds of that propellant. Here we go. We're getting close. Here's our last big event. that have started. Expect right now, venting. the gas closeouts. We have finished pressurizing the storage tanks on board the Falcon 9. They gave the crew the heads up, and they hear some loud venting noises. We're also going to vent down the liquid oxygen line that carried the locks up to the second stage, generates a typical large white cloud of condensation around the strong back. Big event coming up now, T minus one minute, all the flight computers take over. Let's listen in to the last minute of terminal count. Here we go. Under a minute. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and now controlling. FTS is the flight Dragon termination system. Countdown. Launch director. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Oh, I love this. this SpaceX so Endeavor, we can all let's go for launch. Last one. T-minus 30 seconds. It's the last weather gate. Last main weather gate, really. Here we go, 20. Coming up on 15. T-minus 15 seconds. Go Falcon, go Dragon, Godspeed, Axiom 1. Copy, one Alpha. Additional mission downrange. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed, AX1. Stage 1 propulsion is nominal. T plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Orange telemetry nominal. I don't know if we heard it, but we're in one Stage alpha. Stage one throttle down. Throttling down in the preparation for max dynamic pressure. Here comes max Q. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Gorgeous view of the ground there. Execute. Stage one throttle up. Throttle back up. Merlin 1D engines coming Stage back up to power. One Bravo. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. The crew calling out one Bravo should a escape situation arise. It tells the Dragon flight computer what profile to fly using the Super Draco engines. But everything is looking good on Falcon 9. We're getting nominal callouts from all the engineers. 
And a great view from the ground camera and the onboard cameras. Get back, chill, underway. This ground camera operator is solid. Beginning to chill in the second stage turbo pump in preparation for its ignition coming up in just over half a minute from now. Coming up on about three and a half G's acceleration for the crew. We'll begin throttling down the Merlin engines to hold that, period, that level of acceleration. You see that exhaust plume expand out. Next event coming up. We're gonna get main engine cutoff stage of the main engines. Down. Get stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. You've heard the throttle down call out. We're holding three and a half G's for the crew. Coming up on Miko. There it is, Miko. And Miko. Stage separation, Copy, two alpha. Back ignition. There we go. Successful stage separation, ignition of the second stage engine. On the left, the titanium grid fins beginning to slowly deploy. Great views from the first stage camera. The first stage now begins a slow flip maneuver. You can see the white uh, nitrogen gas plumes as we reorient for an entry back through the Earth's atmosphere a little bit later in the plus count. Second stage, we see the engine nozzle glowing red. Everything continuing to look good on the second stage. Should be hearing call outs coming up to the crew here shortly on how the trajectory is looking. Get myself out of the way of that telemetry. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. It's what we like to hear. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. An AOS Bermuda acquisition of signal. The Bermuda tracking station now getting telemetry from the second stage of the Falcon 9 with the Dragon on top. Oh, I see a space mouse. C plus four minutes, 10 <laughs> seconds. Everything continues to be nominal. First stage coasting to Apogee, and then it'll come back down for landing on the drone ship. Second stage partway through its lengthy burn to get the crew into orbit. So Kate, four and a half minutes in, everything continues to look good. I got, I got the space what mouse a making an appearance. Absolutely <laughs> picture perfect liftoff. We've got a live view of the crew inside Dragon Endeavor. Looks like uh, everyone is still pretty comfy. Uh, as John had said earlier, we got Dragon to a SpaceX trajectory nominal. All right, good call out there. Oh. That trajectory is nominal. Uh, SpaceX Endeavor, we copy. There's booster apogee As John here. mentioned, we got to about three and a half G's there. Position of signal, New Hampshire. On so the left-hand side of your screen, we can coming. see the first stage as it is making its way back down to Earth. It's targeting a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, oh, which is parked a couple hundred space. miles off the coast of Florida, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, space caterpillar Second there, Second stage too. on the right-hand side, everything continues to be nominal there as the MVAC engine is powering the second stage and Dragon Endeavor, Dragon Endeavor to its targeted drop-off orbit. So there we go, booster coming back right now. So remember the booster, even after separation, the booster Absolutely continues to go up. views of both the first and, and second stages. SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Just started coming back down. I think 167 kilometers was the peak the peak altitude that the booster got to. Now it's coming down, you see All that? right, so coming up in about a minute and a half, uh, the first stage will execute the first of two burns required for today's landing attempt. Um, at about T plus seven minutes and 30 seconds, we'll see the entry burn begin. That's where the first stage will ignite um, the center engine first, and then a couple seconds later, ignite two more engines, so a total of three engine burn. Um, which will last about 29 seconds. The entry burn slows the vehicle down significantly as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. 
The first stage sees high drag, which scrubs roughly 70% of that velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. Stunning view where you can see the curvature of the Earth there on the left-hand side. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. SpaceX is never weak. There you can see the nitrogen gas thrusters. That's the puff of um, gas that you see there occasionally. That's used for uh, attitude control systems. We also utilize those grid fins that you see. There are four of them uh, placed around the booster. Uh, and those grid fins also help steer for a precise landing, um, either at Stage one entry burn startup. Stage two flight All right, there we can safe. see that that entry, entry burn, burn has begun. We are targeting a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas today. Now that speed's really coming down. to look nominal down. with trajectory and uh, MVAC performance there for our second stage on the right-hand side. That speed drop. So we are conducting the entry burn. Previously, the booster stage was... Stage one entry burn shut down. That entry down. burn helps slow the booster down. It was going about 25 times the speed of sound. So we slow it down as it re-enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. We're now in mode two Bravo, which means if, the, uh, if we have an escape, the crew Dragon capsule would land up by Nova Scotia. That's mode two Bravo that we're in now. The next event is second engine cutoff or SECO. One, as you see it there on the timeline at the bottom of your oh, screen. a little wiggle on the booster. A little wiggle. Sorry. Right. you in thermal guidance. Okay. That's where we shut down the MVAC engine, or second okay, engine cutoff. Copy, Shannon. Stage one transonic. Note that our landing burn and second engine cutoff uh, will occur about the same Impact time. All right, we got a live Impact view of the crew down. inside. Dragon Endeavor there on the right-hand side of your screen. Stage one landing burn. No landing burn through the clouds. Landing burn has begun for the, the first, ocean. Stage, first stage. Six, nominal orbit insertion. Drone ship. All right, great news there. Dragon Endeavor, nominal orbit insertion. Land it. Oh, I see the drone ship. Endeavor. It's going to land it. And it's great to be here. Zero G and we feel fine. Stage one landing leg deploy. SpaceX Dragon launch skip system disarm. As you can see, this Falcon 9 has landed for the fifth time. All the while, great commentary Stage there. Confirmed. While we can confirm the landing. Confirmed landing there of the first stage booster. Also, almost simultaneously, great news uh, for the second stage. We heard that there was nominal orbit insertion uh, for Crew Dragon Endeavor. There you can see a live view inside our Dragon. Looks like the crew is beginning to adjust to zero G. And if you look at oh, the right-hand side corner, it looks like indicator. we can see the zero G indicator. Yeah. No, that was one of my... That, that was one of the things I really wanted to see, what they were going to bring for their zero-G indicator, so I can't wait to see what comes on. It looks, what is it? it looks like a, a I can't dog? quite tell. A Pokemon? A puppy? <laughs> uh, maybe. A okay, well, hopefully it'll, it'll come into closer view. Yeah, but if not, we'll get to ask them later, hopefully. Yeah, great to see the crew here again. What is starting that? to like, Really getting their first taste yeah. of microgravity. Yeah. What is oh, that? Oh, it has ears. Oh, it's a bunny. Yeah, is that like Thumper? A bunny? I think it might be. I think that's oh, Thumper from down. Bambi. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so right now, ah. uh, the second stage is basically preparing for uh, dragon separation. Um, we are, the next step now that, uh, as we said, dragon has nominal orbital insertion, the second stage and dragon will separate. Views there of our uh, MVAC engine now shut off, no longer glowing that lovely shade of orange. Mm. All right, we got our zero G indicator. Right now, the second stage is about 200 kilometers above Earth. Here's looking at the inside of the trunk Preparing of the dragon. Preparing now for stage separation. Or excuse me, for dragon separation. Dragon separation usually should be in about 30 seconds here. 
usually just just For after those of you that have minutes. just recently joined us, we had an on-time liftoff of the Axiom One crew. They are now in space and uh, are coming up to separation from second stage, at which point um, they will then begin to make their journey, continue their journey uh, to the International Space Station. The view that you're currently looking at is inside the Dragon trunk which as you can see has just separated from the second stage. On behalf of the Falcon 19, Thanks, welcome to space. To Thanks for flying Falcon 9. You guys enjoy your trip to that wonderful space station in the sky. Do some great research for us. We'll look to see you back here underground. Now stand by for some words from LD. And MLA and, and uh, the rest of the crew endeavor. Glad we got to have some fun this morning. We'll probably be calling an early weekend over here at the Cape. Pass you over to Anna and the team. You'll be in good hands. Godspeed, Endeavor. Enjoy the rest of your flight. Cheers. Hey, Mark. It was a lot of fun. I venture to guess we had a little bit more than you did. We thank you and your launch team, Gersh, you and the Falcon 19. That was a hell of a ride, and we'll be looking forward to the next 10 days. All right, some nice words there from a couple of key folks. Our first Quindar tone of the yeah, mission. Yeah, I queued up right when I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> there we can. Expected, expected loss of signal, Bermuda and New Hampshire. There we can see uh, Dragon Endeavor on its way to the International Space Station. It has separated. There's a view Dragon inside. SpaceX, we have nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. There we can see over the shoulder of... SpaceX Endeavor, we copy, right there. Over the shoulder, previously, Commander uh, MLA was on the left and pilot uh, Larry Connor was on the right. Live view inside the cabin. They just got the okay to lift their visors. All right. All right. So we can see that everyone is in space. Yeah. We can see that zero G indicator floating around. Great view there um, of Dragon Endeavor. Now in space with the Axiom One crew oh. on their way to the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, this is a day of firsts. You know, this is my first time getting to participate in a launch like this. This is a first for Axiom. I mean, this is a first for space flight. And it's just wonderful to see such a picture-perfect picture launch. It really was. We saw, we saw the landing, <laughs> and we saw uh, orbital or uh, uh, zero-G insertion at the same time. I mean, that was perfect. Yeah. It was wonderful to see. All right, well, as I just said, today's launch is one for the history books. So to punctuate this milestone that NASA and commercial companies are able to achieve together, we go now to Kennedy Space Center, where Megan Cruz is with NASA's Kathy Leaders. All right, so while they're talking, uh, I'm going to turn it down. We can uh, we'll watch for a little bit and uh, leave it up here. But, uh, but yeah, there we go. We've got uh, visors up, Crew Dragon separation. They are on the way to the International Space Station. So they, you can see right in the background of Kathy Leaders there, you can see the transport erector kind of with the lean back there. Uh, you can see that's pad 39A in the background and uh, it's gone, it, it left. Is now in orbit, on orbit. Uh, they've done, uh, the nose cone should be opened now. They do a quick checkout maneuver, which we heard them announce over the radios. They're gonna do a Draco checkout. The Dracos are the smaller thrusters on the uh, on the capsule they'll use the draco thrusters to actually get to orbit not to be confused with the super draco engines the abort engines the draco thrusters are smaller thrusters that they'll use they they're they have pods of them around the capsule and then they also have four of them up here in the nose which they do they open the nose cone to use those that's actually what does the bulk of the maneuvering while they're in orbit because uh, those are a little more uh uh a little more powerful. The other ones are kind of more like fine-tuning ones. So, um, 
Anyways, so uh, yeah, we're in orbit now, heading to the International Space Station. They will be docking tomorrow morning, 6.45 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so they've got about, uh, what's that, like 19 hours to get there. We had a great view of the drone ship landing. That was fantastic. Although they, there was somebody put like a little picture in a picture up uh, on their production in there. I'm not sure what that was all about, but uh, regardless, we got an uninter uninterrupted picture, which is kind of cool. And Aaron Geffen became a channel member. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for jumping and uh, joining the Space Lobster Nation here as a channel member. Uh, what was the square on drone ship landing? Yeah, they. I think somebody just in the production crew accidentally activated like picture, some sort of picture in a picture view. I'm not sure what that was all about, but pretty sure that was just an accident. Let's see, what's with the wiggle? Uh, so the the. I only I don't have my first stage in here. I only got my second stage, but. The sec somebody asked what happens to the second stage. Uh, the second stage, uh, it's low enough in orbit that it should be able to turn around and it's gonna- It's gonna, gonna deorbitate. Right, it's gonna deorbit. Um, so it, it will do a, a deorbit uh, burn. It's gonna deorbit, it'll break up in the atmosphere. They cannot recover it. They have no recovery options for the second stage. So the second it's stage- It's gonna deorbitate. Right, second stage just, just deorbits, so. Um, but the first stage, yeah, so they come down, like if they're gonna land, Right on the drone ship, they're gonna land like this. They actually target, I should do it this this way, right? So if they're gonna land on the drone ship and they're coming in like this, they actually target a landing like this, or actually I think they target long. Or they target long or target short? I don't know, either way, I think they target long. So they target away from, or they may even target to the side. I, I'm not, I don't know to be perfectly honest, but they target away from the drone ship, right? So if for some reason those engines don't light, they're not gonna smash into their expensive drone ship and destroy it. So they target away from the drone ship and as they get closer, they maneuver in. They use the grid fins to kind of maneuver it a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And then they use the engines to actually finally make that last correction and touch down on the drone ship, right? When they come back to land, when they land on land, they do like a return to launch site landing, they target short and they use the grid fins to kind of push it. So they might do that with the, the drone ship too, but when they do a, an RTLS landing, they target short, they target in the ocean and they use the grid fins to kind of push it, to fly it. They use like the rocket bed or the rocket body is kind of like a, a uh, flight surface almost with the grid fins. They kind of fly it to, I mean, it's very, very tiny bit of, of flight surface, right? It's not really the most efficient flight surface. Um, but they kind, of, they kind of push the landing, they push the vehicle further with those grid fins. Um, so they target short until the very, kind of the very last minutes when they correct and get it to the landing site, so. Anyways, I don't remember what the question was, but there's uh, <laughs> there's an answer for you. Uh, Hillary became Hillary's a, a channel member as well. Thank you, Hillary, for joining the ground control. That looks like the drone ship. Are you talking about my phone? It looks like the drone ship? Kind of. Uh let's see. Ec <laughs> excellent use of cell phone props. <laughs> uh let's see. Which which astronaut is sitting where? Um so they had an astro they on the when you're looking at the astronauts faces on the left was uh let's see if i can remember this so the left side yeah the left side was mark mark pathy he's a mission specialist i think he's ms2 technically uh the center left is the pilot that's larry connor the center right is the commander professional astronaut that's michael lopez uh Al alegria I think that's how you say it, MLA. Uh, and then on the far right is the Israeli, uh, that is Aiton Stiva, right? Did I say that right? So that's who's sitting where. And, in, and Aiton is the is another mission specialist, he's MS-1. Uh, let's see, oh, I missed a couple other. We got a super chat from Bernie. 
Thank you, Bernie. Bernie Q for the super chat. I really appreciate that. And Peg, uh, Peg became a channel member. Thank you, Peg. Welcome. Thank you for joining Space Lobster Nation channel members. Uh, let's see. Go back down here a little ways. Oh, and another super chat from Katie B. Katie B has been a channel member now for 16 months. That's impressive, Katie B. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, and the super chat. Katie B said, 15 year old son and I are happy crying because of the poignancy of messages and views. I held my breath till after 72 seconds, but SpaceX gave us perfection. Indeed, it looked like a beautiful ride. From from an outsider's view, it definitely looked like perfection. That's amazing. And Katie B is pretty awesome too. Channel member for 16 months. 16 months going. That's quite the quite the streak, Katie B. Thank you. All right. Well, I think. Uh, I think we covered it all. I think I'm gonna try to keep it short. I mean, sometimes I make these go on, on and on, long and lo longer and longer. But I think we're gonna try to keep them short. Uh, I think we covered it all. Let's see. I could probably I can close all these windows. We don't need any of these things anymore. I wonder. You know what I was wondering? I'm gonna try to pull this up. Actually, we'll do one quick, one quick, quick little look back i was curious if we probably wouldn't but how long ago was launched 23 minutes ago i was curious if there would be any sort of indication like would you get any vibration or anything from the the live sls cam during launch i doubt it probably nothing so here we're i'm backing up the live sls cam see birds flying away like maybe the did the birds freak out or anything is there volume to this Axiom space thank you to spacex and thank you to nasa i'd have to mute this one i don't think there's any i don't think there's any audio on this feed and they ended this one so spacex is done so we can end that I don't think we're going to see any sort of indication. Unless it's maybe just the birds flying away, freaking out. I wasn't sh I was just curious if there'd be any sort of like vibration or glow or anything, but it I mean it is kind of far away from the I mean it's not that far away, but it's pretty far away. I see nothing. Oh well, if anybody sees anything cool that I missed, Make sure to send it to me on the on the Twitter machine, because I would love to. Uh, I'd love to share it out, share it with the people. So, uh, yeah, I think we covered it all. Uh, it's been a while since we've done a live broadcast, but it seems like uh, I remembered how to do most of the things. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, time waster. Uh, you want a you want a landing replay? We can do a landing replay. I can do that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is mission control audio. We're gonna have to go back and go here and let's see. I'm gonna see a landing replay. We'll look at that picture in a picture. Let's see, where was the landing? Is right. Oh, there it is. Well, that was a pretty cool looking landing here. Let's uh we'll, we'll watch the landing here. Let me get myself out of the way. We'll get all that out of the way. We'll put up our replay text. Here we go. Let's look at Second engine cutoff uh, will occur about the same Impact time. Shutdown. Here we go. All Let's right, we got a live view of the crew landing. inside Dragon Endeavor there on the right hand side of your screen. Stage one landing burn. Landing burn has begun for the first day, Dragon, first stage. Nominal orbit insertion. I see it targeting. All right, great news there. Dragon Endeavor, nominal orbit insertion. I see it targeting off to the side and then Great it just kind of slides right in. Zero G and we feel fine. Stage one landing light deploy. SpaceX Dragon launch skip system disarmed. Oh, nailed it. As you can see, this Falcon 9 has landed for the fifth time. It is pretty cool. 
Yeah, and then you see they they had that little that little bit of like picture in a picture thing. I, I don't know. Some somebody pushed the wrong button. They, it's like right at the worst time. Like right there, they activated some sort of picture in a picture, like some like a zoomed in view or something. I don't know what that's all about, but oops. <laughs> But we still got uninterrupted coverage, which is kind of nice, from two different camera views. That's pretty cool, right? Look at that, just nails it. And you can see one of the cool things, like the drone ship, if we back up, the drone ship is off the left grid fin there. So if you look by the left grid fin, you'll see it come into view, and then it just kind of slides right in. Remember, it targets away from the drone ship in case something goes wrong, and then it slides right in. Touches right down. Pretty cool. Uh, Jeff Walsma, how come we don't try to reuse the second stage? So uh, in order to reuse the second, the second stage is going significantly faster than the first stage is at cutoff. So it's way faster. Not a lot of fuel to slow it down, right? This is going 27,000 kilometers per hour when it cuts off versus the uh, the first stage at cutoff. What's the first stage at cutoff? That's, uh, we'll go back. Let's go back to cutoff. The first stage cuts off. It's like it's like five thousand, six thousand, maybe. Does it get up to yeah, six thousand, seven thousand? Does it get all the way to seven? Right there, six thousand nine hundred kilometers per hour is what the uh, is what the first stage is doing at cutoff. The second stage is doing twenty-seven thousand kilometers per hour, so significantly faster having to slow down, uh, that's that's a lot. There's not enough fuel in it. There's no there's not heat shielding protection. So if you wanted to recover the second stage, you'd need either fuel or you would need uh, heat shielding. Heat shielding would add weight and then you need fuel to, to carry that weight. And yeah, it's just, uh, it, it's a complicated problem to try to recover the second stage. It's not easy. So uh, that's one of the things that Starship is trying to accomplish. That's why one of the reasons why Starship is so large is so that they have enough uh, fuel and uh, surface area to slow it slow itself down as well. Remember, uh, Starship is going to do a lot of that the plow into the atmosphere as the kind of that skydiver belly flop type maneuver, uh, and that's to try to dissipate that speed. I mean, that's that speed is killer. Twenty seven thousand kilometers per hour versus six thousand. They're 6,900 kilometers per hour. It's a, it's a big difference. Big difference in speed. I mean, that's like, what's that, like quadruple the speed? Something like that? So anyways, uh, there, we got a, uh, we got that. I'm sure the conspiracy theorists, we saw tons of space uh, appearances of the space mouse. Let's see, right here, you can see there's, there's the space mouse. The conspiracy, oh, there's another one. The conspiracy theorists think that uh, that's a proof that it's a mouse and therefore it's in a studio. It's the, like I said it every single time, it's the most well-trained mouse in history because it makes an appearance at the same point, at the same place, every single time in the same manner. Uh, it, I mean, they have that mouse trained, and apparently they have two of them too now. They have those mice trained uh, I mean, amazingly well. Like that's fantastic. That's I've, that they, the, the, the effort that has gone into training those mice is amazing. So and look at how well they stay put. You know, they they just kind of sit there and hang out, almost like almost like they're stuck in place. Like like as if it's a piece of solidified oxygen that's just kind of stuck there after breaking off from the the liquid oxygen vent port and solidifying. I mean. It's almost like that were were what the case, but but it's not because they're they're mice. So <laughs> at least that's what the conspiracy theorists say. No, it's just solidified oxygen. Uh, it comes out of the vent port. There's a vent. There's a ox liquid oxygen vent port right here. You can see another mouse forming. Look at they they can actually build mice. They're actually building mice on the fly. Not only are they well trained mice, but they build them right there on the fly it's amazing the, the technology they have um so so uh yeah so we had an appearance of that we had an appearance of the uh the space caterpillar even 
Uh, let's see. Oh, I missed a super chat here uh, from uh, Flowevo. Flowevo official, a, a channel member for 14 months. Flowevo official. Thank you, Flowevo. Uh, said, missed your streams and thanks for the coverage from today's flight. Greetings from Germany. Cologne, Germany? Cologne. 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 I don't know how to say that, but looks like Cologne. Cologne, Germany. Cologne. 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 It's from Germany. Well, thank you, Flowevo. Thanks for the super chat. Really appreciate it. They train the mice. We did. It's our space. But oh, yeah, right. It's our space mouse. <laughs> They're building it in space. Frozen. Let it go. Conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Mice tend to multiply. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Maybe they're the multiplying mice. Oh, look at now they're connected. Oh, oh, look at this. They're actually connected now. Look at they're. That's fantastic. Like the mouth there. They were actually one. Of, it was like uh, like uh, conjoined twins there. Those. How to train your mouse. <laughs> oh, man. All right. We have some fun with that. I still think it's the, consp the messages that I get from the conspiracy theorists about the the mice is the, the funniest thing. All right. Well, we need a sensor bar for the mice because they're, uh, yep, they're coming because they're coming together. Yep. Yeah, maybe. All right, well, I think that's about where we're going to end it here. Uh, so our, our launch has uh, has completed. 33 minutes ago, we launched. And, uh, oh, Anita's going to throw in another super chat. You're not going to let me... I can't end it here. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. Appreciate it. Anita has been a channel member and a moderator as well. A moder I'm not sure how long she's been a moderator, but uh, probably longer than she's been a channel member. But a channel member for 18 months. Thank you, Anita. And uh, Anita has uh, sent in a super chat. Okay, now it's my turn. Thanks for the great stream again. Well, thank you, Anita. Thanks for all your work around here. Thanks for keeping up the Space Lobster Nation. Of course, always appreciate appreciate it. Is NASA charging these astronauts to stay at the ISS? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I imagine... I, well, I, I mean... Hmm. And I didn't even think about that. Do they have to pay to go to the ISS? I would think so. I don't know. Does anybody know the answer to that? I don't know, but I would think so. Yeah, I mean, they're they're using NASA facilities. And I don't know. I, I like I would think, yeah, they'd have to pay to uh, kind of reimburse the, the government for their uh, support. Like their, you know, NASA personnel is going to have to be involved in the docking and operations. And uh, yeah, I would I would think going to the ISS, they would have to pay pay NASA to kind of reimburse the government for those services they're providing. That's what I would think, but I have no idea. But yeah. Uh, not the astronauts, but I can imagine Axiom is getting a bill for the ISS and so forth. Well, yeah, so that's, yeah. I guess it's not not the astronauts personally. I don't think the astronauts are writing a check uh, personally. I mean, I think Axiom is because the Axiom is the company uh, that uh, they would have. They would probably have to pay the ISS or pay NASA for... Uh, as, as uh, Fritz Forty Six says, the parking fee. Yeah, I am at. Yeah, because they're getting, they're using all those NASA services, right? So somebody's got to pay for that. Huh. Anyway, I, I that thought hadn't crossed my mind, but that's a good. Uh, who who brought that up? That's a good point. We be good, I think, brought that up. So. All right, everybody. Well, I'm gonna. I'll let you carry on with your day continue on with mine we'll uh we'll hang out a bit uh i've got just in case uh, in case you've forgotten uh I'll, i'm gonna try to have some stuff up on uh on the youtubes for my my piloting stuff i am still working on the piloting stuff i, I did tell you that uh i am i have officially become a private pilot i got my pilot pilot pri my pilot pilot my private pilot's certificate or license it's, it's really a certificate but Anytime you say private pilot license, it, all the, the purists freak out and say, it's a certificate. All right, so I got a private pilot certificate. I did finish that, uh, but now I'm working on my instrument rating, which allows me to fly through the clouds. 
So uh, I still got a little bit of work to do, which is keeping me pretty busy these days. But uh, yeah, we're uh, I'm working on that. So I'm going to try to have some video up. That's uh, so uh, check out my my other YouTube channel. If you want to keep up with my piloting stuff, it's called uh, Pilot Tory. I just recently changed the name. Uh, it used to just be my first and last name, but now it's Pilot Tory. So if you want to find Pilot Tory, oh, there you go. Wild West Dan put a chat in the uh, or put a link in the YouTube chat. Let's see. I could probably uh, help the Facebook people out and maybe put a. Can I put a link in the? Uh, don't know, don't know. Oh, I can't do it in here. I don't know how to copy this. Well, you have to look up Pilot Tori on YouTube if you want to follow along with any of my flying stuff and see what it's like for me to be a pilot, which is kind of cool. A lot of fun these days. Be careful with the PTT button. Yeah, my PTT button is still not fixed on my airplane, but hopefully soon. Still waiting for them to fix it. All right, everybody. Well, that was a fun little, uh, a fun morning. We haven't done uh, done one of those in a little while. So, uh, yeah, that was good. Well, uh, hopefully we can do some more of these. We do have Crew 4 coming up, so uh, we'll try to do that uh, here coming up soon. And uh, then we'll we'll do some more of this another day. I'm not going away, even it's been a little quiet around here lately. Things will pick up again. Just, uh, you know, take it a break. And do it. We're doing a couple of uh, focusing on the pilot stuff a little bit and, uh, you know, trying not to get too burned out on the YouTube thing. And we'll, we'll do more soon. But all right, that's going to do it for me, everybody. My name's Tori. This is Overlook Horizon. Thanks for hanging out with me this morning. Uh, consider joining, continuing the conversation over on Discord. I'll keep I'll jump on there for a little bit and uh, say hello, see what everybody talked about over the last couple hours. And uh, we'll we'll see you guys all uh, the next time here at uh, Space Lobster Nation headquarters. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Oh,